Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, hi, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down, of course, with uh, Keith Myers here, as usual, to talk about Seahawks football. Today's a special show. We've got Dan Viennes of the Seahawks Forever podcast as our guest, longtime friend of the show. Welcome in. Dan, how you doing? Doing good. This is a special show. It's so special that I'm wearing my glasses for it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, Keith, how you doing, man? Welcome in. I'm doing good and I'm thirsty. So let's j- jump yeah. into the, the beer portion of the show. Cause <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You want to yeah, explore the format here? Yeah, we yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is our eighth annual question and answer show. We've been doing this for a while. So every year uh, we kind of set football aside a little bit. We've got uh, both uh, football related questions and non-football related questions going on today. Um, and everyone's brought a few things in and also some viewer questions as well. And uh, so it's just a fun show where we just kind of let it all go. We don't bring a lot of notes in to uh, to make sure we, we cover all the topics that we want to talk about during the day. And we just kind of freelance this thing, which is fun. Um, and especially having Dan here, we've never had a, a guest for the show. It's always Keith and I, we always end up asking the same questions. So in year four, we've asked the same questions that we had uh, asked in year seven. So it's nice to have a little fresh perspective today. We appreciate that from you, Dan. Um, yeah, no, it'll, so be fun. It'll, be, it'll be nice to talk about some non-football stuff too, if that should arise. Yeah. yeah. Well, anything, it will. anything goes yeah. except we decided on one thing, right? Yeah. No politics. Today. No politics. <laughs> no. Politics. Thank you. Thank. Thank goodness. Right. <laughs> okay. So we have decided we are all very thirsty, and part of this uh, show is to share some of our favorite beers in a beer tasting uh, format. So I'll start. I've brought um, my first beer in is from Fate Brewing here, just located down the street from me in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm going to start on the light end of things. Um, and I brought in a, uh, what they call halfway to Heffen, which is a Hefeweizen from them. Mm. And um, I thought that would be a safe introduction to uh, afternoon drinking today. So how about you, Dan? What do you got? So I'm, I'm actually looking up the, because it's been a while. I did the exact same thing. I wanted to start a little light. It's one o'clock here. And I, like I told you before we went on the air that I do intend to hit the gym at some point today, but that might be a tenuous <laughs> situation. So I'm going to start light too. I'm going with a Northwest classic. This is a Widmer Hef. I haven't had a bottle oh, nice. of this wow. in forever. When I first started drinking craft beers, probably 20 ish years ago, drank a lot of wheat based beers and Hefs. Yeah, that was the same one I started to get with. into. That's yeah. Exactly and, and it was always in the Northwest. It was pyramid and Widmer in Widmer's Oregon. And Pyramid is largely was largely Seattle, although they had they had some property in, in Oregon as well. So um, there's kind of a little bit of a rivalry between Pyramid and Widmer, but uh, it's only 4.9 percent ABV. Thought it'd be a good one to start with. Uh, 2023 won the Best of Craft Beer Gold American Wheat Beer Gold Medal uh, at the uh, awards last year. 26 IBUs, 11.7 uh, percent um, OG. And I'm going to take a little sip of this, see if it's as I remember. I, I can't even imagine uh, anybody out there listening that's not familiar with uh, Woodmer Hefeweizen. Oh, I mean, fantastic. that's really kind of been the, the standard for a long time. That was a long time ago, like 28 years ago, 30, maybe even 30 some odd years ago, they got started yeah. there in, uh, in Portland. Not All too right. citrusy, yeah. which I like. And I am a big believer in like, I, the whole add a lemon to your Hefeweizen thing. If you need to squeeze a lemon into your Hefe, not a good half. <laughs> Cheers. I've even got, I've got the football uh, pint going. Yep. Oh, there you go. All right, so, Keith, uh, what are you drinking? So I went the exact opposite direction you guys did. You went light. Oh, it's early. <laughs> um, we were told to bring favorites. And so um, I went with Ooh, the um, cream. Uh, bourbon barrel aged barley wine from Ooh. Frame. Um, it's wow. 11%. And <laughs> um so Keith's got about 20 minutes of good content in him. Yep. And then yeah, I'm going to be let's out. Start with Keith. Actually, or maybe it's the, the worst, other way around. The worst part about this really is fun. that because we said to bring favorites, the other two I've got are also um, on the high end. So 
Um, wow. I'm probably going to be hidden under this desk here in a few hours. <laughs> wow. Nice. So keep, the, keep the questions coming. Folks, <laughs> so we can, we can All right. This is, uh, this is just going to be kind of a round robin thing. We'll see how this goes. It's no. just going to be one of those things. I'll ask the question. Both of you guys can respond. If one of you wants to take the lead, that's fine. I might have specific questions for Dan or Keith. And all the way around too. Keith's going to ask some questions. Dan's got some questions. We've got some uh, listener questions that'll uh, that'll come in. I've got a few uh, to start as well. Okay, first question. I'm going to ask this of Dan. Um, what grade would you give John Schneider and company for the way they handled the letting go of Pete Carroll, the coaching search, and ultimately the hire? of Mike McDonald and company. I thought you were going to get, say the, the entire off season. Um, I like not knowing these questions ahead of time. Um, I think for the most part, they handled it. Well, I just, I, I'm not going to, and I mean, we've talked about this together. Like I think that the hire of Mike McDonald was a home run. I think given the other, uh, candidates that were on the market and given what I think they needed to kind of go in a little bit of a different direction. I think he was the best hire they could have made, but to get there, I do think they stumbled out of the gate. You know, I, I think we all kind of recognize now that the seeds of this decision went back into mid season, perhaps, you know, there were reports that Schneider was putting a list together and that, you know, ownership and, and upper management was really upset, particularly after the Pittsburgh game. So if it goes back that far and and there's some other, you know, things that I've heard about what happened in the days between the Arizona game and the decision to let him go, there were some meetings and there were some, some negotiations, but the fact that they missed the window, um, I think knocks their grade a little bit. If they, you if they would have just the window gotten, as far as the interview, the window as far as being itself. able to interview any of the candidates, right. By the time, they let Pete go and filed their paperwork. They weren't able to uh, to interview the guys that were on buys, correct? Right? They missed that window. Ultimately, though, it didn't change the outcome. Like, they didn't miss out on anybody. It sounds now, from some sources, like McDonald was the guy that they targeted from the beginning, and they ended up getting him. It just, for, for that, I mean, maybe I give him a, a B plus. I do think they handled it as tactfully and with as much class as they could. Um, although it quickly, in my opinion, became a little bit awkward um, in giving him the advisor title, Pete Carroll. And then obviously, you know, we knew it at the time and, and it became evident shortly after that, that that was just an in name only. He's not going to have an office in the building. I remember, remember there were a lot of fans back then that thought he was still going to be involved in the coaching search and some of the personnel decisions. So that was a little weird and awkward. So for that reason, I knock him a little bit, but I think, it was the right decision to be made at the right time and they got the right candidate regardless of what happens moving forward. I think Schneider showed patience and determination in getting his guy. And that's, uh, that's not always easy in this league. Some teams end up settling for their second choice because they get impatient and he didn't do that. And I give him a lot of credit for that. So uh, let's say B plus. I think I mean, you I, also need to take grade. into account um, some of the people that he interviewed um, like the defensive coordinator uh, for the Raiders. I don't even remember his name, Patrick but they interviewed him yeah. twice. Yeah. And I, there was a, it's a lot of head scratchers. It's like, okay, um, guy's barely been a uh, coordinator for one season. Mm -hmm. And yet he's interviewing for a head coaching job um, multiple times. I, I, I'm glad it ended up well. I got glad it turned out well. And then he ended up with McDonald because there were some... I don't think it was a great class. You know? What do you mean? I, I, I don't think it was a great group of candidates. I, I, I Yeah, it I, wasn't. Um, and that's what I mean. Like, he was interviewing some guys. And I'm like, why are you even yeah. considering them? They don't belong in a head coaching search right now. Um, and, yeah, I, it was just, it was, that part was frustrating. Ultimately, the end result is what it ended up being. Whether they screwed up the window in the beginning, whether they interviewed a bunch of, of candidates that shouldn't have been interviewed um, along the way, none of that matters because they got the guy they wanted from the very beginning. They yeah. got the one home run hit out of the cycle. I think it, it bears some resemblances to how 
how quickly the partnership worked when Pete Carroll was hired and John Schneider had already been determined to be one of the three finalists. And, and so Pete ultimately made that decision and they knew immediately that they clicked as a partnership. And I, and I've been in the same room with these two guys at the same time. Like I, 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 uh, I, th- I think the partnership of Schneider and McDonald just clicked and you can see it in the chemistry. Um, that's hard to find. Let me ask you guys this. If in retrospect now that, you know, we know how everything turned out. If the hire had been Dan Quinn, which, you know, the minute Pete Carroll was let go, the, all the speculation was around that's the logical move and it might happen quickly because it makes sense on some levels. How d- disappointing would you have would you guys have been if that had been the choice? Would you have been okay with that? I don't know if that would, if I would have been disappointed. Um, I mean, I would have a little bit because you kind of just want, you want them to go big. Um, and Dan Quinn isn't going big when, um, when Paul Allen ran things like he went big to go get Mike Holmgren and then he went big to go get Pete Carroll. Um, like those were both just crazy, like, big hires, just big names. Uh, and you know, okay. Paul Allen's not with us anymore and his sister's running the team. Um, I wanted them to go big and Dan Quinn isn't that, um, but he was safe and he knew the team and, and he would go back to what made things work rather than the defense, which had just become a shell of its former self, um, in scheme and all of that. And, so I think I would have been okay with it, but at the same time, yeah, it would have been a little disappointing because they, they would have played it safe rather than going big. And I think they went big with Mike McDonald. Yeah. I think, I think it would have been fine, you know, kind of to your point. Like I think Dan has a shot to, to succeed in his second, you know, go around. I, I like the things he's saying and I like kind of what they're building there in Washington. And, and, and I think he was a little bit unfairly stigmatized by how things ended in Atlanta. But you're right. And it, it would it be we'll never know, obviously, but it would be fascinating in an alternate universe to know how Paul handle Paul Allen would have handled all this. Like, would he have would he have moved on from Pete earlier when they struggled the last couple of years or kind of, you know, fell short of expectations? And and if he was around, still on the team, was still alive when this move was made. You talk about big. Do you guys remember? Um, what year was it? It must have been 16 or 17 when Jay Glazer reported that Pete Carroll was considering retirement. You remember this report and Paul mm-hmm. Allen was on a hunting trip somewhere and Glazer came on and reported that Allen already has a list, a fallback plan in the event that Carroll moves on. And it had three names on it. Do you remember the names? It was, no. it was Bill Cower. It was, uh, um, Oh my God. It was Nick Saban. And it was, I think it might've been Jim Harbaugh at that time. I mean, he was a big game hunter. Like you mm-hmm. said, that was his MO. Yeah. And this uh, this off season, the only name, you know, if Paul Allen was alive this off season, would he have gone after Bill Belichick? Would Harbaugh have been the hire? Right. You know, I'm not so sure when you, when you come off of Pete Carroll, Pete Carroll's the oldest coach in the NFL and he had a certain style about him. He was kind of, you know, you very unique. Now, <clears throat> coming off of that and the success and so forth, it's really easy to, to, to make the safe hire. And that would have been a Belichick. That would have been a Dan Quinn. Um, really there was nobody else available in the cycle unless you could have drawn somebody else out. But, um, I think in, in what Schneider did, and we speculated about this a lot on our show and you probably did as well. Um, and you know, Keith was kind of talking about Dan Quinn felt like Dan Quinn was the, the early, kind of favorite, you know, until he wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And and you kind of go to that, to that point where it really looks like they're waiting for, you know, the the Johnson from Detroit or McDonald from Baltimore to get out of the playoffs. And, and then they're going to be go, they're going to press the go button. And that's exactly what happened. And, and I'm real pleased that I think it turned out exactly the way that if you drew it up on paper, uh, if this process would have started on time um, with interviews right after the season ended so they could at least get one in. I think it turned out exactly the way that it probably would have. The the I think you really have to hand it to John Schneider on the patience part of it because it's so hard to be patient. 
in the NFL, the pressures are so intense to do it right and to get it right and losing out on an opportunity or a candidate can be devastating, especially if you go all in. And I think you saw that in Washington. I think Washington really wanted one of the same two candidates that we were looking for and they missed out mm -hmm. on both of them. And Dan Quinn was plan three plan, you know, plan C. And I think yeah. that would have been the view of the Seattle situation had we gone with Dan Quinn. So while I think it would have been okay and we probably would have, you know, continued on really kind of in, in kind of a father figure kind of coach coming in. Now we've got an opportunity to really completely change it, completely change the dynamic. One of my follow-up questions to, to my first question was, what kind of grade would you give Mike McDonald on the way he built his coaching staff? Mm. And I would argue that the same sort of patience was kind of shown. He had a plan. John Schneider had a plan. They worked together to kind of bring Leslie Frazier in as a mentor, assistant head coach. That was brilliant to me. And then the grub signing and pulling him back away from Alabama and, and so on and so forth. I just and those are the things really that I think a home run. Those are the things I think would be different, right? I, I mean, what you, what you guys and I do, you know, on our shows, like the off season narrative would have been completely different. You know, it would, I think there would be much more of the fan base questioning the hire and, and more cynical about Absolutely. what the next step is. Whereas, you know, I think almost universally, there's a lot of optimism right now among the mm -hmm. fan base, but the coordinator choices would have been different too. Would Dan Quinn have hired Cliff Kingsbury here? I mean, that would have, that might've set the fan base on fire. Yeah. You know, Especially well, yeah. Keith. Keith does not like that guy. Yeah. I don't like him as a head coach. He was a failed head coach in college. Um, why would you hire him as a head coach in the NFL? But as an offensive coordinator, the reason why he got head coaching opportunities, both in college and in the pros was because he was a brilliant offensive coordinator. So I wouldn't have hated it. Um, but, it, you know, hiring him as a head coach was just an idiotic move by Arizona. Um, I just think about all of this and I go back to if the CX had had that first meeting, um, if they hadn't missed that window and they'd met with McDonald early and they were like, oh, great, this is done. Um, I think this whole process would have been different. And I go back to 2014 when Dan Quinn was hired by Atlanta away from Seattle. And they had done that. They had met with him during that uh, that early window and kind of decided he was going to be their guy. Mm -hmm. And even though the CX were in, um, in the playoffs, you know, heading to the Super Bowl, all of that, and they had to wait, uh, it didn't bother them that they had to wait that long because they already had their guy. And while they waited, he was able to hire Shanahan and uh, then Shanahan was able to put the offensive staff together. And those kind of things that happened, you know, while Atlanta was technically waiting to officially hire Quinn, I think it would have looked a lot like more like that had the CX gotten mm. the Pete Carroll thing done a day or two earlier so they could have gotten to mcdonald uh i don't think it would have changed the outcome i think it would have um we would never grub just wouldn't have ever made it to um, alabama i think he would have just gone straight to seattle um and, and and that kind of stuff now there might be some position coaches and that kind of stuff that ended up different but in the end like the big pieces i think it would have just it would have the story would have been different but the outcome would have been the same yeah, it's an interesting point. You wonder if the defensive staff would have looked a little bit different, you know, because he would have had a chance to get in on those guys early and make them offers. And 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 then, you know, as the playoffs went on and all of his, you know, key defensive assistants started to get interview requests themselves and, and three of them end up being hired as defensive coordinators, you know, two of them elsewhere and one got elevated to replace him. So maybe Adam Dirty isn't the defensive coordinator, you know, but mm -hmm. um but yeah, he might really not have changed anything on offense because it, it sounded like, yeah, it sounded like he had had his eye on Grub for a little while. So, Okay. So um, who else has got a question? I'm sure you guys came equipped, right? Did you get, you guys mentioned, you mentioned Leslie Frazier. Did you guys see his interview with, uh, on Move the Sticks? I started, I, I watched the first 10 minutes and then I ran out of time and I haven't come back to it. Keith, did you see any of that? No, I haven't seen it at all. So hey, um, what did I miss? Cool. I uh, must see TV. Like it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a uh, Bucky Brooks and Daniel Jeremiah. Yeah. And, uh, and they got into some pretty specific stuff, mostly about, uh, they were trying to 
kind of blanket the conversation with, you know, how do you keep the secondary connected to what's happening up front and some of those, some of those principles, but he kept like name checking guys on the Seahawks. And one thing that he kept saying over and over, he kept going to Reek Woolen and he was asked a specific question about how do you recognize that a guy is ready to be a, sh- a true shutdown corner? And by that Bucky framed the question as when do you decide a guy or what do you need to see from a guy to recognize that he's capable of traveling with a number one receiver. And he said, you know, he gave his answer and then he said, you know, we were able to do that with Tredavious in Bellevue, in Bellevue, in Buffalo. <laughs> uh, and we, we think, we hope, we think we'll be able to do that with Reek too. Wow. Like that they think that they might see for all the questions this off season about him coming off a down year and maybe you trade him cause they have depth there. And it, that, you know, that Leslie Frazier with all his time in the league and working together with Mike McDonald, that they might see Reek Woolen as a guy that could travel with a team's wide receiver one. Uh, it was fascinating. Mm, based well, on after his rookie, rookie, I'm not surprised yeah, after his at rookie all. Season, I, I could see that, you know, and I don't know exactly what happened a, last year. He had the injury, Keith, he had the injury and then he kind of lost his confidence and, you know, he still played well in, in the larger picture of, of things given the fact that the entire defense played like crap but um certainly a letdown from his rookie yeah. season and then i'm very curious to but, see how this coaching who staff on, can who get him to play didn't underperform last year yeah. this is the, the this is the statement i keep i, I keep coming yeah. back every time bill and i have this car who on defense didn't underperform like yeah. every single player except for maybe witherspoon underperformed last year and so I, I, can't, I can't really hold that against him. Go back and look at his rookie rookie year. He was as close to a shutdown corner as his team has had in, um, since Richard Sherman. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not surprised they're talking about moving him. But the fact that you've got him, that they're talking about, oh, he's a shutdown guy. He's the guy that you'd move around. You've still got Witherspoon on this, t- on this defense. Mm-hmm. He's still one of the best cornerbacks in the NFL. Um. It's one of the things that gives me the most that I'm most excited about this offseason is you talk about the the issues on the back end last year and, and we've heard enough players talk about it and some of them are kind of thinly veiled shots at the coaching staff, but just about the the poor communication and guys just not understanding their, their assignments and where they're supposed to be. And everything you read about McDonald and how he teaches and how he installs. And, and keeps it really simple and then makes all the keys, you know, based off in sometimes one word audibles and calls and and to just simplify it so guys can just play fast and instinctive because that's what we saw from Rick Wallen as a rookie is just, I remember the pick he had in Detroit where he undercut that ball in the middle of the field. And that was just pure instincts. It was, he came off mm-hmm. his guy, right? He read the play, he read Goff's eyes and, and he just came over and made a play and he looked like a five-time all pro. If you can, get that guy in a position to where you get his confidence back and just let him play, you know, confident and free and easy. Uh, you know, we're all going to be really glad they didn't give up on that guy just because he had one, you know, seemingly down year, which may have been related to an injury. Yeah. Keith, you got a question for uh, Dan? Um, I got a question later, Dan. Um, what is your uh, Seahawk tattoo? Like, where is it? What is it? So it's, it's basically evolved into a sleeve it started with a, and for those of you watching, I'll try and show as much as I can. It started with a, I have a skyline, Seattle skyline here. You can see the Space Needle and, and Mount Rainier and Lumen Field. Although at the time I got the tattoo, it was CenturyLink. Um, and then the, the forearm is a little harder to show, but it's it's uh, on the backside. It's Steve Largent making sort of that. It's one of the most iconic pictures of him. It's in the kingdom or it's in, it's in Lumen Field. My God, I'm showing my age. He's kind of laying out for a ball on the inside of the forearm. Yeah, I, I, there, you go. there you go. On the inside of the forearm, I've got Marshawn. Just, um, you know, not ne- necessarily my two favorite players, but some of it's visual too. I just wanted Marshawn to represent that Super Bowl year. You can see the Super Bowl number behind him. The Lombardi Trophy is up here. This is supposed to kind of look like crowds in the background. The 12th flag is back there somewhere. Kind of worked in all around it. Um, interestingly enough, I got to show this to Marshawn two weeks ago. Nice. Um, 
he was dining in a restaurant and uh, just being chill as always, just not even like a private booth or anything. He was just a, with some friends just at a table right in the middle of the dining room. And he'd come into the server station where we were hanging out to, to ask about something and um, to deal with his server. And I took it, the opportunity to show him and he like grabbed my forearm and he looked at it kind of really closely for a couple of seconds. And then he looked up and this, these are his exact words. He goes, that's a dope tat, bro. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then I pointed oh, out, you know, awesome. I, I showed him Largent and I said, he kind of made a little self-deprecating age joke about himself. So I, I showed him Largent and I said, so I got the old school and then I got, and, and then he cut me off and he goes, oh, and then he got the old school too. Um, so that was kind of <laughs> cool. But, but yeah, I think so, Seahawks wise, I'm kind of done. I think that's complete. So, yeah. So I have a follow-up question. Um, one of our, our best listeners out there, uh, Kristen, uh, from our YouTube channel has a follow up question for Keith on that is Keith, which is your favorite tattoo, your favorite, My favorite tattoo, tattoo. Or, or, um, or favorite tattoo in general. So, oh man, I've got, I've got so many tattoos, like favorites. They're all favorite. Every single one of the ones I got, I freaking love. Um, I love my, my cat. Um, which I'll, See if I can show that on on YouTube. Let me let me see if uh, I can get you. Nope, it's getting in the way. Wait, I think so. It's yeah. a uh, cat yes. playing with an atom colored in as a galaxy. That one's I love that one. I don't know why. Um, that one kind of stands out, but it does. But then my most recent one is my Seahawk tattoo. Um, what's the best? That's way to the do old that? school. Yeah, yeah. Um, I and, considered uh, that, that one, design when I got my first uh, one of my first tattoos. Yeah. Yeah, so that one that one's awesome, and it's actually better. It's it's more than just um, you know my Seahawk tat, and and that I love for that reason. It's also one that I share. Like me and a friend both got it, um, and she's um, been de- battling cancer, and she's been getting matching tattoos with all the people that have supported her um, during her cancer fight. And I know that she just had like her twenty eighth surgery um, as part of that. So to give you an idea of where she's at. And so, um, that that one's really special to me for a lot of different reasons, but the fact that it's also a Seahawk one does not, um, does not diminish it in any way. Uh, I freaking love it. And so those are are probably my two favorites. I do not. Keith, do you have any tattoo regrets? Yeah, I do have one. Um, I got a wedding ring tattoo and it blew out and turned out just ugly because mm. the artist that did it um, just overpacked everything and it turned out nasty. And I had it had to have it redone by a different artist. And uh, even then, it's not what I wanted. Uh, at least it looks good now, but it, it still wasn't what it, it was supposed to be. Um, that's my only tattoo regret is just mm. having the wrong person do one. Yeah, I did that early wow. on there. My first one got me hooked and then I rushed into a couple of little things after that, that I almost immediately, immediately regretted, but it taught me a, a, an important lesson that you pay for tattoos. Yes, you, you don't, do. you know, tattoos, LASIK surgery. There are certain things that you don't take the discounted deal, right? You don't take mm-hmm. the one that's on sale. Absolutely. Um, and so I had those covered up, but one of my biggest regrets is actually because it turned out so good. So I don't know if we're going to talk about music today at all, but this is from a, an oh, old journey will. album cover. Uh, it's from the evolution album. Um, and I like, it turned out so great. This is 10 years old and it still looks almost brand new. Like I like it, it. so much awesome. and it gets the most comments, but my regret is that I didn't do it on the inside of my forum. Cause I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I could do it all over again, I would have put it on the inside so I could see it every day. All so I saw you, I saw you on another social media channel, uh, comment the fact that, um, journey is your favorite band and you've seen them live 10 times. I think I beat you. I think I've seen them live like 13 or 14 times okay. over since 1981. <laughs> I'm going to add one to that in September. So and, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, me too. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, the Def Leppard journey, journey and Def Leppard yeah. at Chase Field, uh, downtown Phoenix, um, at the end of August there. So with Steve now Miller. Who's band opening on that just, bill? Because it's rotating. Yeah, Steve here. Miller band. Okay, here we're getting Cheap Trick. Uh, I was a little disappointed. I've seen Cheap with, Trick open for, for different bands like a hundred times. Damn. And it's usually, I you know, I go get my beer, I settle down, and Cheap Trick's just getting off the stage. I've seen them so much. They're just one of those uh, typical, like, get the crowd going bands that... Yeah. Um, 
sometimes I'm, I'm into it and sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I've seen them so many, I just don't even care. But they were um, actually the first band I ever saw live because when I was 13 wow. years old, they opened for kiss at my first concert ever. So the <laughs> nice. first band I ever saw was literally <laughs> cheap trick. Wow. Well, but you're right. The first band I ever saw was Ted Nugent and uh, Hart in downtown Seattle at um, Frank, not Franklin Field. But what, what, what's the field there at Seattle Center? Oh, it's Memorial what, Field. Memorial Stadium Field. Right. They were there, and this was like 1970s. Oh, pre MTV Hart seven. <laughs> Yeah, this is right just, after they just rock and didn't put out. any makeup on. Right. right, this is this is what's the second album after where Barracuda came out? I can't. Little Little Queen, something like that. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the that's the one. So um, okay, so thing. this is my favorite you guys. part. This is my favorite part of when the three of us get together is that you guys are both <laughs> audiophiles and just <laughs> are into that scene, yeah. and I just love to sit in here listening because I've. <laughs> I've been to a couple of concerts, but I've been to my whole life about is, is less than what Bill does in a year. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, and Dan too. Dan's crazy. Yeah. I'll tell so you what, is, the, the, is, I, just, I just love listening to you guys talk about it. It's just, just awesome. So I, I was going to one of my questions. Where the concert industry is right now. Oh, so it's, it's, it's horrible. You know, I've been waiting it's 10 so years. It's expensive to yep. go to. Like, I've been waiting for anyway. 10 years for Creed to, to reunite and and have been predicting it for the last four or five because th- it was obvious that it was going to happen. And they finally do this massive tour and they're ignoring the Northwest in its entirety. And so I've looked at places to go and it's like, forget airfare. It's 800 bucks to get a ticket. And it's just dumb. It's dumb. Yeah. I really, you know, we said we weren't going to talk about politics, but. I'm really rooting for the Justice Department in their lawsuit against Live Nation and Ticketmaster because it is a monopoly and the fans are the losers and it needs to be fixed. I agree. Okay, so follow-up yeah. question in broad terms. <laughs> Keith, you can participate if you want. Favorite concert. So I'll go, I'm will go. i going to go mm-hmm. first because I want to answer my own question. So Pink Floyd, I saw him in the Division Bell uh, concert series and then, um, you know, the, what was it? The... the Division, not Division Bell, um, but Momentary Lapse of Reason. So I saw both those tours. That was that was amazing. But I am seeing David Gilmore at the Hollywood okay. Bowl in October. Mm-hmm. And he's only doing shows in New York and L.A. currently. And um, so I am I had to go. I had to get tickets. I'm, I'm going in for just one night and, and back out. But... I think that's going to end up being in my top five and I haven't even, I don't even know what a set list is yet, but it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Um, and then I got to say Alan Parsons project, Tom Petty at the gorge, um, was a fantastic show. And then I just saw last year, you two at the sphere, which was, it just automatically Gosh, goes man, into your top three amazing. shows because the sphere itself is just the, yeah. is kind of the highlight. And then whatever bands going on, it's like, it's crazy. But how about you guys? Keith, well, you got a favorite? I, I'm like, I do have a favorite, but it, and it's it's recent. Um, I took my dad and my kid, so we had three three generation of of Myers men to um, see the Eagles last year at. Um, That's a at good Moda. show live. And I'll, honestly, like they're a bunch of old guys, but damn, they can still they can still shred. They're they're fucking awesome, and I don't like that. Cost a lot to get the three of us in there, and I don't <laughs> I don't. I do not regret a single penny of that. It was a tremendous show. Their set list was like 40 songs long. Um, and it would have to be, <laughs> you yeah. know, I just gonna, saw them at the footprint here on Phoenix last, uh, like, about like four, four months ago. And they were okay. Like Vince Gill had a cold and they were just off. Oh. Whatever reason they were off that night. I'd seen him and their health freezes over to her before. So I saw him with Glenn Fry and the whole, you know, the original kind of lineup there. And, and they were amazing. I was just thrilled. And, and this time it was a little bit more disappointing, but I get you. That was, they, they do tr- such a tremendous job really. And just kind of play note, note for note. They're kind of a, one of those session bands from old, the old days. And so they're very keen on duplicating the, the album sound and, and so forth. And, and it's, it's kind of like sticks. I don't know if anyone's seen sticks. Oh yeah. Kind of the same thing. They really try to duplicate the the albums note for note on stage and yeah. um mm-hmm. and, the, and another sticks is one of those 
one of those rare bands that even at their age, like they still sound phenomenal. Like that's not always the case. That's the other thing. Like concerts are so expensive now, but yet you don't know what you're going to get. Like you might go yeah. see an old, you know, an old vintage nostalgic act and the singer can't sing anymore. Like that's, it's trying to come up with my favorite <laughs> show have, of all time. Bill and I have seen that. Um, the, the singer can't sing anymore. Remember when you, when um, I went, well, um, took my wife and I and, and you and your ex to um, Foreigner. Um, and uh, God, who Kelly was, Hansen the, um, was the lead singer. Who was the mid, who was the the, the, the the second of the three shows? It was Whitesnake. That's who it was. And God, wow. not only did they look freaking like they got group rate on plastic surgery, um, yeah. but they couldn't sing anymore. They couldn't play, like, Pretty much, it was the drummer and a bunch of amateurs, but it wasn't. It was like the actual people. <laughs> it's still they David Coverdale, yeah. yeah. They were I've seen awful. I've seen videos, and oh god, they, it was they, bad. They they have to just to even give him a shot to sing the songs. They have to tune down like a couple of full steps <laughs> to the point that like the songs that you're so used to, like, like they're not even recognizable. It's true. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. So now, and he's and he's amazing. And when he was younger, he he was amazing. Yeah. He just had one of cool. those voices. But I'm telling you what, like Tommy Aldridge on the drums. So, um, Tommy Aldridge used to play with like Ozzy Osbourne. He was, he was like on, on all the, the best songs that Ozzy ever had, you know, off his first two or three albums and, um, like bark at the moon, all that kind of stuff. So Tommy Aldridge was definitely the highlight of that show, but Tommy Aldridge looked like he was dead. Like he, he was like Skeletor. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he just looked like Skeletor. He was the, I was like, he was the what is going creeper. on? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. But, um, other than that, um, who else? So, okay, let's 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 do another. Uh, well, let me answer topic. the question though. I want to I want to answer oh, the, yeah. oh, the, oh, my yeah. favorite oh. concert, right? Okay. So, uh, and this one's hard because I kind of go back and forth between like what was just the greatest show I saw, and then what kind of had the biggest impact, right? And um, like oddly enough, I don't think my favorite show of all time is a journey show. I mean, those are all right up there. I mean, I got to see Steve Perry in his prime multiple times and on some great tours. Um, I, I mean, I'll never forget the Frontiers tour when he had Brian Adams uh, opening. Oh, uh, oh yeah. And, and Brian oh, Adams yeah. was young and they opened their tour. There's a documentary out there that NFL Films created. You can find it on YouTube still, uh, documenting the Frontiers tour. It's amazing. It looks, it, it spends a lot of time looking into like the crew and what it takes to like put on a show and a tour. Wow. Um, but it's they opened in Seattle. They built their stage here. They spent two weeks re re rehearsing here, and then they opened it here. And Brian Adams was relatively unknown. He had like one hit. Well, he was unknown. That was that's, it. That's that like was a night first I think US he was on the radio. Yeah, concert. Yeah. By the time at the end of that tour, it came all the way back around. They played Tacoma again, like ten months later, almost at the end of the tour. So they made a complete loop of the country, which no one does anymore. And by that time, Brian Adams was massive. So to see like the progression was really cool. But I have two that come to mind. One is I was reminded of this the other day. I was just going down a YouTube rabbit hole and somebody posted a complete concert that was shot really well and had soundboard audio of Bon Jovi on the New Jersey tour. Wow. And we all have recency bias of like what a gray haired 50, 60 year old John Bon Jovi looks and sounds like now you forget how, unbelievable he was as a front man back then and they were so much energy and just the way he worked a stage and and his vocal ability dude, back then, dude i've got a i've got a it story reminded me of the show that i saw on the new jersey tour in tacoma where they actually shot the video for lay your hands on me and that was the tour where they had the catwalk and so even though i was sitting about halfway back in the crowd about halfway up at one point they go on the catwalk together and they're right in front of my face so that probably has to be the one like that was Bon Jovi at their prime. And Oh, by the way, Skid Row opened up for him in their prime wow. and Sebastian so, Bach was just, so I had, I had, um, so I saw Bon Jovi in their very first large concert ever at BC place in Vancouver on the runaway tour opening wow. for the Scorpions. Okay. Um, Damn. and I was in the front row. And See, back so then I, you could I, do that. Did you I just walk row into center. the I just grocery store ticket? I just totally squeezed up there. I, you know, 
And oh, I got up okay. there pre pre show, and like Bon Jovi came out, and it was front and center, and he was right in front of me, and then you know Klaus Mine was right in front of me after that, and it was one of those shows that, and I was nineteen years old, and um, it just blew me away. I I was like, this is a show. I mean, it was one of those things where you know you're going to because you know like five songs, you know at least back then it was like on the radio, and I bought an album. I didn't know who Bon Jovi was at the time. Um, and so I was just going to see the scorpions really. And then Bon Jovi comes out and like blew everyone away. And like, you know, everyone was and and everyone being all, all the ladies just absolutely just loved him screaming like crazy up there. And, and and then the scorpions came on. It was, it was just a, a juxtaposition of style because it was a, it was just this prima Donna kind of character Concerts will never be like they were back then. And and that's why all my memories that are popping into my head now are of seeing those bands in their prime because fans were completely engaged, right? And you watch some of those videos, even if they're poor quality, and it just gives you goosebumps because the crowd is into every single moment and every single song. And now it's like the place can be sold out. Everyone's, and I've been guilty of this too. Everyone's got their phone up and they want to be quiet because they don't, they're trying to capture the perfect video and that's their memory of, of, you know, this right. show forever is they can watch their, that video on their, on their phone where these memories that, that we're having are like visceral and they give me goosebumps. And you live in the moment. You got to live in the moment. Was, how it felt. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Don't All right. Like that again. Um, one more off topic and then we'll go back to football a little bit. Well, first let's do this. Mm-hmm. Let's pour another beer. Mm-hmm. That is a fantastic idea. I was idea. just like my last one. <laughs> I don't think I'm getting to the gym, you guys. I already just down the first beer went down really easily. So, Keith, remember, what are my, you going to switch to beer, here? My beer was 11%. Um, so that one, are you done with it? One, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my last one was a um, bourbon barrel aged barley wine. Um, mm-hmm. My next one is going to be another barley wine, It's but it's maple. It's a maple barley wine from Freem. Um, oh, wow. This one runs, a, if I remember right, about 12 and a half. Oh, um, this, this is gonna get good. Eleven and yeah. I remember that slightly wrong. I said this is <laughs> this is this is um, it's already it's already ready getting bad. It's only gonna get worse. Um, but this is <laughs> you guys. At, the thing was, it said bring your bring your favorite. Well, you know what? My favorites are all um, typically barrel aged. They're typically imperial, yeah. and they're typically let's, dark. Let's see that thing. Let's see that. And this one is much darker than the last one. That looks hearty. Frosty mug too. I love that. Yep. That looks viscous. uh, You probably can't, you can't see it, but um, there's a, there's the, the C, uh, CX playbook logo logo right there. If it wasn't quite so dark, you'd be able to see it. I've got, I've got that one. So I'll show the, I'll show the logo really quick. Here while you're doing that. Here's what it looks like. I'm going to run and put my third one back, back in the fridge because it's going to get warm. Be right back. See the nice thing so about mine. ones that are the, that are this dark and this strong is they actually taste a little better when they're not quite so cold. Now you don't want them warm, you don't want them room temperature, but you don't want them, you know, forty two degrees out of your fridge. You want them um, about 45, 48 degrees, somewhere in that range. And so, so I'm okay, actually so in, now in it's, good shape. it's it's time for amateur hour. Uh, time for amateur hour here when it comes to beer pouring. Um, I love this beer, but it can't compete with you. So this is a 4.5% alcohol, alcohol by volume. It's a little bit more my speed, Keith. It's a Smittix Red Ale directly from Dublin, Ireland. Now, um, I fell in love with that's this beer. Too, yeah. That's a good, I fell in love good, with this beer when I was ale. in Dublin a couple of years ago. And um, it's kind of my go-to there because I just love ambers. I'm kind of an amber yep. guy. And this thing is gorgeous. So... It's not, it's gorgeous. It's a little darker on the camera than it is. And it, it's kind of really dark, dark amber. And, um, but it just has a real nice, smooth taste. There's no after bitterness about it. It's one of those beers that, one of those ambers that you can drink even when it's really hot outside, so, which is really important to me here in Phoenix. And so, um, nice and refreshing and, tasty at the same time and it's only four and a half percent so it's one of those beers that i can have you know maybe even two or three of 
and not feel so heavy and, and weighted down and, and obviously not so lightheaded, if you will. And it's I, I, try that. I, I've been looking for lighter beers recently, lighter by, you know, lower ABV a little bit and just not as, not as heavy. Um, sorry. The automatic cat feeder, it's cat feeding time. Uh, so I'm going to go for my second one. This is uh, from Ruben's Brews. This is their Hazelicious Hazy IPA. I know we did Hazy's the last time we did a show together. Um, but this is one that I happen to have in my fridge. Um, this one is six point or 6% ABV, 45 IBUs, kind of middle of that range. Mm-hmm. It's got uh, some Citra, Comet, Simcoe, Strata, and Azaka hops. Nice. And, wow. uh, honey, oats, pale, pilsner, and wheat malts. So it's a whole bunch of... Wow. Kind of a whole melting pot. And you inspired now, me. This to is get an IPA. My, this is an IPA, Dan? It is. It's a hazy IPA from Ruben. Any, so it's an East, is, East Coast style? Pretty much anytime you hear the um, the word citra in a hops, it's going to be an IPA. Um, and yeah, hazy is a New England style. Um, as opposed to a um, you know, Northwest style, uh, which is typically very clear. Which... I'm going to finish with a bigger IPA as my third one, but uh, Bill and I were talking about this off air a little bit. Like IPAs are getting harder for me to drink. There's my palate's just changing. Mm-hmm. Just some, some, some of them are just so hoppy, which is why the hazies are kind of a nice sort of a middle ground between an amber. And yeah. An IPA. Cause the hazies are getting, are getting more, they're, they're fruitier, they're more citrusy, but they're not quite mm. so just pure bitter. The, the pure Northwest IPAs are getting really strong yeah, um, and just for a while. straight up like just hop tea and it's uh, it's getting overpowering. I, I don't know if you guys are uh, paying attention to uh, the comments in the in the live stream comments. You can find that over on the right oh, side. I didn't have it on. Top it's all of our, on. Oh, our, hey. our app here. But um, the hey, last question just friends. came in and, and nice, nice comments so far. And, there, and this one's nice as well. Bob Holness is asking, um, nice choice of beer, guys. Do any of you like Belgian beers? Uh, Lefe yes, and absolutely. Chimay are my personal favorites. I am uh, I do like Belgian beers. They're a little, you know, for people who um, aren't used to them, because typically they're a little more wild yeast. So they've got some other flavors that are involved in, in, in a true Belgian style. Um, you know, I, some of them are really good. Some of them can get funky really quick. Um, but there's a few out there that I really like. I, I just really enjoy. So, um, yeah. 20 years ago. Tomato stuff a, a, a lot, but I haven't heard of the left, left 20 years ago, I was managing um, a restaurant that had 160 beers on tap and I was responsible for all that inventory and the wow. ordering. And uh, so shout out to Eric Briggs, who's in the comments, his favorite concert, Pearl Jam at Benaroya Hall, a good old mm-hmm. friend of mine, friend of the show. And uh, we actually met at this particular place that I'm thinking about, a place called Tap House Grill that doesn't even exist anymore, but it, it was really cool. It was kind of patterned after you, I'm sure you both know, are familiar with the Yard House chain it was kind of pat enough that sort of concept yeah, yeah, yeah. good good quality food and then a really good beer lineup 160 and so when i first started working there like the strongest beer i would ever drink is like a manny's right like a pale by the time i was the gm there for two years by the time i was done i was having a couple of belgians every night after work and uh haven't probably had one since i gained so much weight <laughs> in, that, in that last year because Belgians are very, very rich and heavy. They also make you very, very hungry, which would make me eat uh, really terrible food uh, at the end of the day, which is the worst thing you can do because when you have a little bit of a buzz, you've had a couple of beers, you don't crave kale. No. That's, that's not going to You crave do kale right. anytime. <laughs> you crave beers or not. <laughs> nachos. And All right. Yes. All right, guys. So let's get back to football. Let's talk Seahawks football. I've got a question for you. Uh, right. Dan, you go first. Keith, you can follow up. Of the top three picks in this year's draft, Ooh. Seahawks picks, which player has the best opportunity to have the greatest impact on the field? 
as a rookie or overall as a rookie career at as a rookie I think it's Byron Murphy. I, I just, I think that he's such a dying. We don't even know if Christian Haynes is going to get on the field. Like, I think this McClendon Curtis stuff is real. I kind of do. Um, and so Haynes might be more of a long-term play and maybe ultimately. You know, the Seahawks, the Seahawks moved. have McClendon Curtis listed over at left guard on the, on the depth chart too. I'm just on curious left. about that. Interesting. On yeah. the left. Yeah. And behind Lake and Tomlinson. Um, and they still have. I wonder if that was Anthony only because Bradford, Bradford as, the, as the number one right guard. Now that would make all the sense in the world to kind of to get off topic for a little bit. If, if they saw, uh, if they saw Curtis long-term on the left side after a year of Thomas and that would make a lot of sense. But anyway, I think he was getting I, all those reps just in case I really do. Now I think that Anthony Bradford always had the inside leg on this because he had 10, 10 stars last year, but Christian Haynes, come on. I do believe by the end of training camp, Christian Haynes wins that job. Now that anything can happen, but I expect that. Now, Anthony Bradford, though, if you really go look at the advance, we were like kind of the offensive line was crap last year, right? And Anthony Bradford, Bradford was part of that, but he played okay to the point where Seahawks fans are like, well, we could plug Anthony Bradford in there. Well, if you go look at the advanced stats, he was just not that good. Now, he was a rookie, but is he the long-term answer? We just don't know that yet. He's kind of a road grader kind of a guy, but the pass blocking was really questionable last year. Christian Haynes would be the automatic upgrade at that yeah. position. So I fully expect him to kind of take that. And then Bradford's sitting there, yeah. very capable as being a backup. But then on the other side, you mentioned McClendon Curtis, a guy that we really hadn't paid attention to. Seahawks picked off a practice squad last year, kept him on the active roster so they could keep him. Yeah. Gave him just a, kept name dropping him advanced too, contract this last him. year, a futures yeah. deal. And here he is competing his ass off, right? That's the cool thing about this team this year is everybody's competing again. It's like yeah. nobody's going to be handed a job straight out of the gate. Yeah, they've looked at the film. They've got some ideas about who they want to have be successful and start. Um, both on offense and defense, but these guys are really getting a look this year, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But to answer the question though, I think it's Byron Murphy. I just think, I think he's an elite talent. I really do. I, I, the more I loved the pick to begin with, he was my favorite pick leading up to the draft. I still, it was kind of rubbing my eyes. Couldn't believe that we, things fell the way that they did to me. It was a no brainer when they were on the clock and, and I think he's so good. I think he's going to have an outstanding career. If he can keep all, you know, if he can manage and handle, you know, that transition to being a professional football player, that uh, I think they're going to carve out a role for him as a rookie. And I, I think he'll force his way into the field. He's that good. I mean, I, I've never been so impressed with a defensive lineman in my life, just watching him work a blocking sled. Like, I know that that might sound ridiculous. His laser. Legs it's are just amazing, trunk. like the strength in his punch, and then his le his his foot quickness to to just make those subtle little movements to get around a guy, um, and then you know, and not even to mention like, I mean, that's a, that that would play into his pass rush ability. But when you watch his tape and you see him, uh, his I just always tell people if, if you haven't watched Byron Murphy yet, go find his Alabama tape. You can find it on YouTube all twenty two and go watch him against Alabama. They're double teaming him the whole game, and and he's still affecting the play, impacting mm -hmm. the play, because that base, like what he's able to do with that butt <laughs> and those thighs. Well, do you remember, you remember, down, obviously, Earl amazing. Campbell from the Houston Oilers, right? Oh, of course. And how big his legs were you, yeah. when you saw him in person. And I did many a, a couple, three, four different times. I was, you know, in, in the kingdom. And the, the dude's leg, that's all you saw. when, Like when yeah. you saw him in person, and he was, he was just a truck, but his lower body was just amazing. So yeah. is Byron Murphy's. Like mm -hmm. Byron Murphy's legs are just, he's got so much torque available in his lower half that that's where he's going to win. Like, mm -hmm. seriously, that dude's going to have an amazing, I think, career. Now, I don't so, know if he's going to start like the first six games out. Is no. he going to be like all world? I don't know. Maybe. He might not, yeah, he might not ever be the starter. Like, but he'll rotate in. I, I think Mike McDonald wants to get back to that kind of Pete Carroll 2012 to 2015 thing where they're just, they're rotating guys and keeping them fresh. 
but he may. That's why I asked the question to be completely honest, Dan, it's like, who is going to have the most impact on the field? Now, still think yes, he will. Byron Murphy, yes. Time. Okay, but yeah. there, the, you could say, and hear me out, Tyrese Knight. Um, yeah. Now, Maybe. I'm not, I'm not saying that he's going to be all world. I'm not saying that. I'm just yeah, saying the that the middle there are question are marks. There right. are question marks yeah. at linebacker yeah. right now that to. give him a significant opportunity to be play. on the field more than you would want or... And and so he could end up racking up some stats this year that impact games or or re, or have plays that result in turnovers, or and so now he could conversely be on the on the wrong end of that where he could be the the weakest link on the team, which I believe maybe at least starting out he would be, but as time goes on he could eventually have a, an impact level that is the most visible on the team. Now, Byron Murphy is going to be there in the center, in the middle. Sometimes those guys get lost in the shuffle. Maybe they're not stat stackers and they make things happen for other players. Yeah. Byron Murphy yeah, might I fall into that sure bucket in this first season. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Christian Haynes could start all year and, and be an impact guy, but he's in the interior of the offensive line. Therese Knight could be a guy that could rack up 10 tackle, tackles a game and have a pass break up and have... Uh, an impact on the players around him. And I'm just saying he might have the most impact on the field in mm-hmm. 2024. I, think I still think the answer be, is Murphy. Um, I just think that his ability to affect plays, you're going to, even if he doesn't play much, when he does play, he's going to show up. Um, yeah. He's going to affect plays. He's either going to be getting sacks, getting pressure, um, disrupting a run play by getting into the backfield. Um, he's just too freaking good. Um, yeah. he, like I said, even if he doesn't play much, Tyrese Knight can play every down and have rack up a ton of of tackles. And I think you're going to see a lot more highlights of Byron Murphy anyway. And Knight's got to earn the, the shot first, right? I, I think it's going to yeah. be one of the most interesting storylines in camp is – He's he's third team right now on the Seahawks steps chart. I mean, Baker and, and Dodson were out all of all of mini camp and OTAs, and and it wasn't Knight running in their place. It was O'Connell and it was Radigan. So like he's got to right. he's got to get his shit together and 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 get into the even the second team conversation first. Now I do think they might carve out a role for him. You know, I think he's a guy that can maybe even play on the edge a little bit, just kind of in some packages and 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 with what McDonald likes to do in disguising things, but. Um, he, he, I mean, if we were making a list of like three most intriguing players heading into camp, he'd, he'd probably be on that list because, you know, he had so many detractors, uh, you, you know, just of the draft pick himself. Was he too raw? Was he taken a little too early? But then you find out that John Schneider essentially deferred to Mike McDonald on that pick and that they moved down in that round, knowing they'd miss out on Cedric Gray and a couple others because they, they were confident they could still get him. And that's the guy McDonald wanted that like, you know, until he proves otherwise, I'm, I'm bullish. I'm bullish on that pick, but it might take a little while. Well, and McDonald knows linebackers. Yeah. Like if it was, you know, if he had done that for a safety, I would have been like, uh, okay. Okay. But he's not a defensive back coach, but he knows linebackers. So as much as I didn't necessarily love that pick because I don't think he covers well, I don't think he does, you know, he is, um, he's an old school linebacker who comes up and makes plays at the line of scrimmage against the running game in a league that no longer runs the ball that much. Um, you know what? Mike McDonald knows linebackers. He was a linebacker coach before he was a defensive coordinator and I'm going to defer to him until I'm told otherwise, you know what I mean? Right. Until something happens on the field that makes me doubt, uh, that call. So let's uh, let's ease into the offensive uh, side of the ball as far as uh, a question. Let me ask you both. In your estimation, at the end of the season, let's look into the crystal ball. Um, which side of the ball will have had the best season? Dan. It's an interesting question <laughs> because, you know, it's perception is, is such a, you know, fragile thing that, I think that I expect the defense to improve dramatically. 
when you think about it in terms of even if they end up being a league average middle of the pack defense this year, that's a massive jump, right? Yeah, it is. From 30th, yeah, 31st, from the, most category. 15, right? Yeah, yeah right? right? You're, you wouldn't be considered one of the elite defenses in the league, but that's a huge jump. And then I think the general perception by the end of the year would be that, you know, hey, the defense is back. This is a defensive football team again. But what I see when I look at offense is all the continuity in the skill positions that if that offensive line can be manageable in its first year, because offensive lines need continuity too. I, I would expect, I like the pieces they put in place. I like the fact that we're talking about guys that might be third on the depth chart as having an actual shot to start. I think they've added some good young dynamic talent in, in a more, you know, more volume to that spot than they have in a while. And that gives me hope. But if, if things, it's going to take a while. And so there might be fits and starts this year on the offensive line, but if they can be manageable and allow Ryan Grubb to operate that offense the way he wants to with, with a, you know, an experienced quarterback coming back and all of his weapons in place. And he even added a couple of things to that. I think the defense getting to average will allow this offense to blossom. And I think if we're going to win games this year, nine, 10, 11 games, it'll be because the defense improves to the point that it lets that offense flourish. And I think that offense is much, much better than people outside the Pacific Northwest are giving it credit for. And it's because they discount the fact that part of the reason they weren't as productive last year is because they were dead last in the league in number of plays run because the defense stunk so bad. So I, I so, think at the end of the season, we might be looking at that offense saying that's what carried us this year. So I'm going to pause everything just real quick. I want to remind everybody that Dan Vienz is here as our guest, Seahawks um, Forever podcast. Uh, You can find it on your favorite podcast platforms, both on audio and video. Talk to me, Dan, just a second about your show, uh, what you've been talking about, what's coming up. Yeah, Seahawks Forever uh, has been about a year and a half now since I rebranded it after uh, Vox Media shut down all their podcasts and the Field Goals podcast went away. Um, Longtime former, way, way, way back in the day, television broadcast journalist and play-by-play guy. And and, uh, and so the the focus of my show and just the way that my brain works and so the way that I present my show is, is I think, similar to what you guys do. Although you guys get the gift of being able to play off of each other, which is nice. Um, is I just try to take a thoughtful look and 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 a balanced look at what's happening with the team, both on and off the field. Um, you know, I'm excited that it's July. Happy July, you guys! Like happy training camp month. Yeah, we get to know. We, we get We're to say this a month weeks now. away. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. seventeen days yeah. from rookies. Yeah, and then yeah, we get yeah. some real substance. So you know, the next couple of weeks are interesting. Um, I'm working on my all underrated team right now. There's polls up on Twitter. They should be finishing up any moment. If you haven't gone over there, if you're listening or watching, get over there and, and get your vote in. And then I'm going to do an all overrated team. You know, that's the kind of stuff that during slower times, I'm sure you guys know that you kind of lean into, but I've got a couple things up my sleeve too. A couple of big time guests that I'm really, really excited about getting on between now and the time of training camp, just uh, matching up vacations and schedules and things like that. So uh, I like having Good. guests on the show, so keep an eye out for that. Nice. Love it. Right on. Okay. Uh, Dan, do you have any questions? Oh, so I, I'm fascinated by this and it's been a lot of fun to go down memory lane. Um, the last couple of weeks I did another podcast where we talked to, we kind of put together an all time team and then you struggle a little bit sometimes with some people's definition of overrated and underrated, but, but they're fun concepts to play with. So I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on a couple of players, regardless of position, regardless of era, uh, like that you think in Seahawks history get overlooked. Now, maybe they were really good starters. This doesn't have to be a rotational player or role player. Sometimes some of the best players we've had in our history get overlooked over time or just overshadowed by other players. Uh, Keith, start with you. Just a couple guys that immediately come to mind of of players that you think are really overrated, underrated. Really, I'm sorry, really underrated. underrated. Oh, okay, underrated, um, undervalued. First, when overrated. you said when you said that, the first name that came to mind was Max Strong. Um, it was a fullback, and but he was a 
guy that could pick up a blitz as well as anyone, receive the ball out of the backfield, take a draw from Matt Hasselbeck and and do stuff with it on, you know, third and medium. And plus he's got the best name. Like that's a perfect name for a fullback. Right? <laughs> I is. mean you got <laughs> right Max or a linebacker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, linebacker, linebacker. You gotta play one of them. Um Honestly, he was the first name that came to mind for like um, underrated uh, former Seahawk. And then after that, um, probably do you remember Anthony Simmons, yeah. middle linebacker. Um, He's in the pool. Of the Tupu, um, undersized, fast, injury prone. But the dude, God, the guy was fast. And he, when he was healthy, um, he made a lot of, of other holes disappear because of his speed. And I really liked watching him play. So those are the two, those are the first two names that popped into my head. 15 years, 14 or 15 years in Seattle. Yeah. Sometimes you go back and in, in doing research for that, this team, like you are reminded of, first of all, between the seventies, eighties and nineties, like players just stuck around longer. It was easier to resign. Yeah, totally. A lot mm-hmm. of players, a lot of some of the Seahawks all-time greats played 10, 11, 12 seasons uh, in Seattle. That just doesn't happen anymore, right? Um, but yeah, Strong played, I think, 15 years. And even then, like, could have played longer if it wasn't for the neck injury. Probably would have. Yeah, probably would have played three or four more. Yeah. Because he was yeah. still he was still a really good player. Um, and he's just one of those guys that I, like, I know that most people don't remember. And right, that yeah. makes me sad because he's God, he was so much fun, yeah. uh, especially so, for me. A part of it though is, is training camp. Um, I liked going to camp when they were in Eastern Washington. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. And you, you could walk up and you could literally stand on the sideline of drills because yeah. there's nobody else there. There wasn't, there wasn't like the crowd 10, of thousands. people there at a time. Yeah. You had 10 to 15 people. And so you could literally just walk up and stand next to whoever is standing on the sideline and talk to them or whatever. And I remember watching some of these guys and um, yeah, guys like Max Strong, just like quintessential Seahawk in my brain. Um, he is to, to the Seahawks what Jay Buhner is to the Mariners, right? Um, just this guy that mm-hmm. was never the superstar that um, outside of, you know, Seattle, but damn, does he just per- personify the city and the team. So I've got, I've got a couple, um, I go way back. I mean, I, I saw the first game in the kingdom. So, you know, my, my frame is, is a little wide compared to, to some fans. Although there are plenty of fans that go, go way back. Uh, John Harris comes to mind as a guy, as a guy that's underrated. Like he was just a, a tackling machine and an interception could play the ball better than almost any defensive back I ever saw. Like he just had the instincts uh, uh, that were top notch, top end. And he was second fiddle on, on the defensive backs that were on the roster at the time, like Dave Brown. Yeah. Dave Brown was an amazing corner and you never hear about Dave Brown anymore. It's a, just a crime. It really is. Time is undefeated. I mean, you just, they, these guys get buried in, in the, in the lines of history and Dave Brown if he was in the NFL today would be a superstar, superstar, yeah. just mm-hmm. a, an interception machine. Mm-hmm. And, um, a guy like for me, lunch pail guys I, I, were, were just the definition of football when you were growing up and you wanted to emulate those guys. Joe, Joe Nash, Nash comes to mind. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Joe uh, Nash. Got played a long time and people played feel a long time. time and not only played leaders and tackles, one of the leaders in sacks. Yeah. You know, just the single team, Joe Nash, like there was no other player that defined like lunch pail better than Joe Nash. It's he wasn't going to get any accolades. You know, he played on on a line with Jacob Green and um, and a a few other guys um, later on. And um, he just was a transcended time kind of a, a dude undersized, but just as feisty as you could probably possibly be at that position and then another guy opposite side of the ball same sort of deal as Robbie Toback mm. oh, you know yeah. Robbie Toback was just totally amazing as far as just being a the standard bearer for lunch pail carriers in America <laughs> he 
he just he wasn't going to go to any Pro Bowls or anything like that. But he was super steady year in year out. A guy, a guy that you just plugged and played and didn't have to worry about anymore. We always kid on our show about long snappers never having to mention their name, like Chris Stoll's names. Mm-hmm. Like you right. never really have to talk about him. You, you, we don't even do special team shows at all yeah. because what's the point? It, there's it, it's just steady as as you go. And, and Crystal kind of defines that. It's like, you never have to mention his name. He's doing a great job. I feel Robbie like Robbie Toback was the same way. What's unfortunate about long snappers is they need to have a stat. Like they don't, there's nothing to attach to them. Can't we with, you know, I don't know, GP, chips in the ball and all that. Can't we like at least come up with a stat of like accuracy of their snaps or something like these guys get <laughs> no love because there's nothing to attach to, to their performance other than, if they don't screw up, they're probably pretty good at their job. Um, okay. So Dan, you've been really fresh in this topic and you've got it currently going yeah. on for your show. What, what are your like top three guys that you, that just come to mind to you? So one that I discovered through the process of putting this together and even in regards to an all time team that I helped put together on the Hawks on rundown podcast last week. Uh, I think you talk about forgotten guys and overlooked guys John L. Williams. It's funny that, you know, Keith oh, brings God, up. Old yeah. Mac yes. Because totally. what, what people don't understand about his era is he technically, he was a fullback. He was not a tail. There were times that he had to play tailback because of injuries or whatever. Some, you know, he was a fullback. He's in the top 10 all time receiving and rushing for the Seahawks. Oh, yeah. like he was, he was the best such receivers out of the backfield. I can remember. Oh, and I just he remember those whole days. Though. He mostly played fullback. Um, he was the, a third the, down back um, in in today's NFL, but he was a in today's I NFL. Mean, yeah, he'd be he more of like a hybrid, and and yeah, I forget his dimensions. He was really a fullback um, that weight? people think about. He was he was, he was Damn, the, a pretty good size back. So he was like five eleven, yeah, two twenty five or something like that. Reference. He wasn't over. Oh yeah, he wasn't overly huge. Five eleven, two thirty one. Okay. Yeah, he, yeah, was, he, was, I mean, he was. He was. Full, he was a fullback, but he also wasn't a fullback. In that, right. if you he look at his hybrid. usage, he wasn't a lead blocker. This wasn't a Max Strong slash Michael Robinson type, you know, lead blocker guy. He was a guy who caught the ball out of the backfield, picked up the blitz, um, ran the he ball so uh, extremely well. Pass. Just like, yeah, God. I mean, you was, look at his, yeah. So five hundred forty six catches in his career. This is just like wow. the the kind of the prime of his career. He went. From his third year to about his sixth year, 58 catches, 76 catches, 73 catches, 61 catches, 74 wow. catches. Wow. Like, I just remember that. They the used team, to run that didn't screen the, he play. he lead the team in receiving one of the years? I, I it, swear it I remember him been, leading the team in receiving. Might have been 89. He had 79 catches, six yeah. receiving touchdowns. Um, yeah, he was insane he, he, and, that he would have that many. He was such a good athlete for his size. Like, he was so smooth. Um, you know, made two Pro Bowls and, and was second in offensive rookie of the year. His, so let me ask you, you imagine, he gets, he gets can you imagine the 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 chaos, the revolt of a team taking a fullback in the first round? The way this <laughs> went, the, when the CX took his, because John L. Williams was yeah, a first yeah. round pick, if I remember yeah. right. Um, 15th overall in the 1986 NFL draft out of Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine, like, Oh my just God. the pure riot that would happen if you yeah. took a fullback in the first round now. So I have a question for you guys um, around the, the running back position. What do you guys think about Sean Alexander? Like I, I, I can't quite figure out why not only the Seahawk fandom, but just in general, it's like you never hear about him. He really kind of leads the uh, team in all time stats on, you know, rushing touchdowns, et cetera. Um, how do you view him? What do you think his place is as far as kind of a hall of fame candidate? I think he's, he's massively underrated by Seattle fans. Um, yes. He had a tendency to run out of bounds rather than take that hit, but he, that led to him having, a, you know, a, a, a lot of games played and not a lot of games missed. And um, you look at like, you know, the 2005 season with 28 touchdowns on the ground and 29 overall. 
that person doing amazing. that from memory. So that, that could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure those are the right numbers. Um, those are just crazy. And won the MVP uh, vote that year. Yeah. Um, just absolutely crazy stats. And I was in, um, I was in Arizona in Tempe because they were playing at the University of Arizona Stadium. Um, then Arizona the, State. Yeah, or that's right, Arizona State, because the Glendale Stadium was was under construction, and I saw him make a ninety five yard um, touchdown run um, in person, and just like honestly, I don't think there's anything that I've seen that's similar in terms of just the ability to take the ball have to like make people miss in the backfield and then still take the ball 95 yards for a touchdown and glide the way. Yeah. And just, just, and make it look so freaking easy. Um, yeah, he was a fun, fun guy to watch. God, he was fun to watch, but I get that people, you know, you look at him and then you look at Marshawn and Marshawn is universally loved because his ability to like he was a warrior. instigate const instigate um, contact and just bowl people over. And then the beast quake run and all of that, you like, just think about that run. Um, it, it, and there's a dichotomy there between Alexander's um, not wanting contact, wanting to bounce everything and versus Marshawn Marshawn's loved and Alexander's kind of like not liked overall. Um, and I think that's, I liked, uh, I think Sean Alexander is, is very much underrated by the Seattle fandom. So a couple of comments coming in. Um, I don't buy a lot of jerseys, but I still have Max Strong's. That's nice. from Dave Asp. Nice. <laughs> right. Seahawkers podcast, maybe Brandon. I hope, not sure, but one of those guys. Uh, not many running backs who were ever as good as, as the inside the red zone guy as uh, Sean. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Misfit 74, I attended Sean Alexander's record-breaking game run at Husky Stadium versus the Raiders, 266 yards rushing, and I think three or four Ooh. touchdowns, right? I think I was there, too. If I remember that game right, it was pouring rain. I remember that game, and what I remember about that game is it felt like redemption. It took 10 years, but it felt like finally we we were able to get the Raiders back for the um, the Bo Jackson game <laughs> where it felt like he ran for 800 yards. <laughs> no, Seattle. I was at that Monday night game, the Bo Jackson game oh, God. Um, <laughs> against the Raiders. So I was, I was there sitting in uh, row seven, section 135 seats one, two and three. And that was, that was the season tickets at the time. And um, that guy, oh, God, that guy was I amazing. Felt like, I always felt like Bo got a, 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 raw deal from that play and he's because Bo Jackson was so and I mean Brian Brian Bosworth got a got a raw deal <laughs> Bo Jackson was such a force he was so big and strong and he was going full speed and he was he was just a just an unbelievable force of nature and Bosworth didn't hit him head on he's coming from the side and trying to make that tackle I don't think there's any linebacker in the league that would have stopped him short of the goal line on that play I think it was just no. hype and everything else wrong place and, wrong time yeah you know I, is there anybody if you if you if he didn't have to deal with injuries God, and he could have played an additional injury. seven eight years eight seasons in the NFL would he no? have gone down as the greatest yes. NFL player of all time oh yes. I think he legit absolutely I believe he would have been a Hall of Fame player in, in two sports. I, I yeah. really do. If it I, hadn't I been for that hip injury, he was um, so gifted. I think that absolutely he would be thought of as the best running back in NFL history mm-hmm. in, over mm-hmm. Jim Brown. Um, and that says a lot because, I mean, Brown is like, got like godlike status, um, you know, amongst NFL fans. But Bo was so talented, so big, so fast, so powerful. Um, if he hadn't had that injury, honestly, there's no one better. There's just, there absolutely is no one better. And what a fluke thing. Like, you know, just that hit had to be just right. The hip had to just, it, it just, what a shame. It didn't so, even uh, look hey. like a bad tackle. It didn't no. even look like a thing. No. It just looked like it looked routine. Yeah. And boom, the end of one of the greatest careers of all time. I did want so, to comment on the Alexander thing real quick. I, I do think yeah. he gets a bum rap and, and, 
it's unfortunate because people, you know, they remember the last thing they saw. And the last thing we saw was after he hurt his wrist, Sean Alexander shied away from contact. It affected him. It impacted him and, and changed him, not for the better. But his first couple of years in the league, like especially when he was an MVP, even though, you know, people want to discount him or discredit him because of that offensive line that he operated behind, you know, do you take away from Emmett Smith, all-time leading rush in the NFL? How many Hall of Famers did he run behind, right? How many great offensive lines did they have? It was kind of the backbone of that team. I, He wasn't that way his first couple of years in the league. He would lower his shoulder, and he was, he was bigger than people remember. And he would run you over and make contact, especially as, you know, Seahawkers, whoever that is, shout out to Clinton or or Adam or Brandon, uh, it, you know, once he got a nose for the end zone, he was almost unstoppable. It, he did change as and a player. He did too. I mean, he got, he, he just took it to another level. Like he yeah. had another gear, like at some other juke motion quantum thing going on. Um, yeah. when he, when he touched the ball inside, you the, can't inside just say he had zone. a great offensive line and not give him any credit for that. Part of being a great running back is sensing the crease. Right. And knowing where to go. It's one of the things that I still question about Kenneth Walker. There are some times that there's a hole in a crease there and he ignores it and cuts another way. It's you, you can't just, you know, take all the credit away from the running back. But when it comes to the question of the hall of fame, this came up on another uh, live stream I was watching yesterday. It's tricky. It, it's, you know, I, I just pulled up the numbers. He's well, let me ask you this. Is Ezekiel Elliott a hall of famer? No. Okay. Because, because there was a nice is a nice name. Um, Had a couple huge years, Cowboys, which helps. Not the longevity, right? But yeah, just but statistically, he had two good years, and the rest was kind of mediocre. Let me ask you this: If Derrick Henry retired today, is he a Hall of Famer? Absolutely. Wow. Okay, Derrick Henry has nine thousand five hundred and two yards rushing in his career. Over a seven-year career, I, I think it in it eight years, down, Sean Alexander ran for ninety-four. It, it comes but down Derek, to what kind of impact did you have on right. your team it's and on the game and, and getting into the playoffs? And after you were in the playoffs, what kind of damage did you do? It's hard to it's hard to make the case for either one of those guys. In, in if you if those are the criteria. Now, yeah. if you're just standalone running back and you're looking at touchdown, Sean's eighth all time. Yeah. Yeah. So this I mean, is why definitely I think has got to be in the conversation. I think Sean deserves to get in. Um, I think Ezekiel. I wonder Elliott, if maybe he's one of those guys at the Veterans Committee. You know, like later on after his eligibility runs out. Yeah. I don't. It's yeah. It's tough. Running okay. Back, question tough for you guys. Um, how are you guys doing on beer? Halfway through my. Second. I only have a little bit left of number two. All right. I'm so in, ready in for five minutes, three. If you want to do minutes, it. we're gonna. In five minutes, okay. we're going to okay. pour another one. I'm cool with that. All right. So I got a follow-up question on running backs uh, as a whole. Keith, this is for you. Looking ahead, crystal ball, who will have a better career in Seattle? Ken Walker, the third, or Zach Charbonnet? Ooh. Um, I'm going to go with Ken Walker, the third, simply because he's had a better career so far. Um, given the given the chance to, of both of them healthy last year, it was Walker that was um, the starter, the more productive player, and all of that. And I'm going to lean on that. But man, that is not the greatest. Um, I don't feel I great about that. That that Ken, choice. Ken Walker can two. do more with less. So having an inferior offensive line is not such a detriment to Ken Walker as it would be to Zach. And that proved out last year, I think. Yeah. I mean, his speed is something that, that Charbonnet doesn't have. Yeah. But Charbonnet's power, I think has the ability to be kind of a difference maker for him to the ability to take a three yard run and turn it into a five yard run regularly, given a, a semi-competent offensive line, which he did not have last year. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about that. It's but a I fascinating question because I, my first inclination was to agree with you, Keith. I just think he, I just think Ken Walker has more dynamic qualities and he's, he's, he can hit the home run anytime. Like he's one of those guys, he's like a home run hitter in baseball, like anytime he can knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. But, and, and I do like that they seem to be, uh, there's some messaging 
this offseason around their desire to get him more involved in the passing game, which is something I've been screaming about for the last couple of years. Like, it doesn't even have to be an exotically designed screenplay. Just use him as check. And you know ball. Ryan Grubb's going to do that. Get the ball to him in space. That's just right. part of his MO. But then you start, but then as, as I was listening to you talk, I'm thinking, okay, let's look at it from a business standpoint, though. Ken Walker's going into his third season. Right, he'll be eligible. His con- next 2025 will be the last year of his deal. You know, who knows where running back contracts are going to be by then? Probably kind of settled into where they are now. Zach Charbonnet is a year, not necessarily younger, but contract wise. Like, does Charbonnet maybe in 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 a weird way have a better opportunity to be here long term? Then Ken almost Walker. like the Sam Hell question, right? Like he can be he can be a complimentary mm-hmm. piece for the next couple of years. They don't want to pay Walker market value. They give that money to Charbonnet instead. It's not as big a contract because he's the second guy, and then he gets a second contract. Like it's it's there's there's a world where Zach Charbonnet becomes a longer term fixture. This is why we pay you the big bucks, Dan. Really, <laughs> this, is, this is it right here. No, I think it's like a really good point that like Walker is the better player. I right. think that is he's more um, dynamic for sure. Who gets the yeah. second contract? You um, can't sign them both to you, second you, can, you can't you can't sign them both to a second deal. So which one do you give the money to? Yeah, because if you give the money um, to Walker, Charbonnet is going to want to walk. Yeah, he's going to want to look for an opportunity to start. But somewhere. I think that the way it works out, because Charbonnet will be cheaper, he's more likely to get the second contract, and mm-hmm. therefore more likely to have the longer contract, the longer Seattle tenure, and who knows? a bigger overall impact. Two years from now, Seahawks could be playing with a, a quarterback on a rookie contract and you can afford to keep them both, you know, or you can pay Walker, which because paying so, a running back nowadays, you, you know, is only what the Ramondre Stevenson deal. That's kind of the baseline, right? Eight so million, based on the uh, based on the intellect that was just displayed in that in that answer, I have a follow up question that is that is amazing. If Bill, Keith, and Dan were handed the keys to the Seahawks car, based on our collective years of experience and deep dive of scouting, drafting, and roster building, we've been at this for a while. Do you think we could build a successful franchise? The three of us? As a group, yeah. Egotistically, I want to say yes, um, (laughs) because I have... right. I've done the scouting thing, especially around the draft, for long enough to know that my success rate is pretty damn high um, when compared to, you know, NFL. But at the same time, honestly, nah. I'm I'm not egotistical enough to know or to think that I know better than guys like Schneider. I don't. I just straight up don't. And it's more Um, than just football. I like that. football it's operations, football, yeah. quote unquote, is a big thing. Like it's a, it's a lot of business acumen, a lot of, a lot of personnel yeah. stuff. You know, it just goes on and on. So that's I like my that take is, yeah. is I, I think, I think the end, the end all answer is no, but honestly, like there's part of me that wants to say yes, because yeah, I've got an ego a little bit. And two, because I've got a pretty good track record you look at our you look at my shadow drafts that i do every year which i don't think we actually did a show on this year um which is interesting bill um but my shadow drafts that i do every year my shadow drafts tend to be really good they tend to be like maybe in the sixth and seventh round i i I fail but the you know the first four the first five rounds i've got a really high hit rate um and I like to think that I could probably manage. And it's not just you in a silo. It it would be a groups thing, you know? Yeah. And so that's, that's to me where, so if I was to answer my own question, that's where I would have the confidence. Like the, the combination of experience, the combination of, of business stuff that, that I've done, the combination of deep dive uh, scouting and mock drafts and all that stuff. I mean, you just in it for so long, you build that knowledge base. And I think combined together, I think we've, we, we could do, you know, a pretty decent job and we could learn the rest. Um, but I do think you're people, right though, Keith, you got to have an ego to be able to say I could do it. Yeah. And, you know, for a while though, you know, if, if I'm being completely honest, I always thought that maybe I could somehow figure out a way to get a front office job somewhere. 
where I could get in and, and then start to work towards that and, and be maybe an assistant GM at some point, you know, but um, obviously that's not going to happen. We do this show. It's for fun, you know, all that, but it would be an interest. It's an interesting exercise. Well, I'll um, take the, let's do this bill. So just you and I have been doing this for eight years. Um, given the idea of my re- scouting reports versus results on NFL quarterbacks and offensive line, how would you rate me versus NFL GF- GMs? It, that's so hard. That's so hard because when we do mocks and we talk about these things and we look at players and evaluate and, and then they, they turn out or they don't, you know, whether it's on the Seahawks team or another team, it's hard because you're, you're judging that in a, in a silo based on the idea that there's no, there's not 31 other teams competing for the same situation at the right. same time. And so it's hard to evaluate that process because it's, it's just like every other mock draft out there or, or writer out there. That's not an actual GM that is going through that process with a group of people, scouts, area scouts that are having to compete for that pick with 31 other teams. And it's, I think that dynamic gets lost a lot of times. Um, but yes, just looking at players and evaluating. Yeah. I mean, you, you, if you've been at it for a while, you identify and, and you and, and Dan as well. And, and my, even myself, you, I, you end up identifying the players that are really good players and would fit on any team, your team, other teams, et cetera. And they tend to, to pan out pretty good. But like I said, there's 31 other teams. You're one team. You might be lucky to grab one player that we've mocked over and over and over again uh, that, that ends up having an opportunity to be on your team. So it's, it's hard that way. Yeah. I've always, I've saying. always thought if I could, what? if a genie came down and said, you know, getting three wishes or whatever, you can change whatever you want to change, or maybe I get reincarnated or, or can be sent back in time to do it over again. Like NFL GM would be my dream job. Like, I think that's just how my brain works. And it's what I, it's the way I see things. And, and it's kind of my approach to doing the channel, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. whereas, whereas Agreed. fans, fans just react to every single move or rumor or report or change just based on what is in front of them and what they, what they like and what they think they want. I try to think about things more in terms of, well, what if like, maybe, maybe we're not looking at the, the, the big picture here. Maybe I don't like this particular trade proposal on its surface, but why does it make sense? Why would it make sense for them? And I think that helps me to arrive sometimes at some more balanced conclusions. Whereas a lot of fans just, they're they're just, you know, it's all emotion. And I used to be this way, you know, I used to be that guy that just, that's all I thought about is what I wanted. And that's my favorite player. And I don't care if he's declined. I want him around until he can't walk anymore. Right. Um, And it's, but I do think people underestimate the, the full scope of that job and and what it entails. And it's amazing to me that these, that these guys ever have any social life or that they ever get to relax. Cause I mean, it's like, Oh, no kidding. It's 24 seven, 365. That's it. Right? Like I've always just been, I just want to have, I want to hold an NFL GM's phone in my hand for like two minutes someday. <laughs> just see how okay. many notifications come in. We're going to pour <laughs> our, our third and final. Oof. Yeah. I got to go grab mine. It's in the, uh, okay. I got it in the fridge. Hold on. Okay. So Dan's heading off to um, to re, um, get his out of the fridge, and I have gone with my third. Um, this one is a um, double barrel maple pecan. What? Uh, smoked porter. Wow! So it's been aged oh. twice in in bourbon barrels. Um, it's a maple pecan smoked. Porter, I've had. Oh my God, this is like, and it's from Frame, and it's one of their like one-offs that you could only get if you're part of their like club 
um, situation, which I was for a couple of years. And before I decided to let that lapse, I got a whole bunch of these and, and, and other ones. And I'm just going to say it. Shit's good. Um, so, so I, w- yeah. I'm going to say this. So Keith is, is amazing at this. So I don't have the, um, I'll just say it. I don't have the guts to walk into a, a beer store. And mine locally is, is total wine here in Phoenix where, where there's dozens and dozens, hundreds of choices for single options, single beers or, or six packs or whatever. Um, but to, to choose that beer requires a certain elevated level of competence in beardom that I just do not have. So I, I want to pause. Now I need everybody. to know what Keith is drinking. What uh, right. Right. Okay, so, so I want to pause everybody. Over there? That, no. that Keith is a, is a kind of a, a home brew specialist. Yeah. He's kind yeah. of, yeah. he's got this thing, right. That he's this knowledge base that I just don't possess. Now, Dan, works in an industry where it's his job to kind of know about general specific, you know, things about yeah. every beer and so every drink that ever yeah. existed. Right. But right. Keith right. has got this hands-on approach that I admire. Um, so, so yeah, tell Dan what you, what you've got. Yeah. Going so on. this is a double barrel um, maple pecan smoked porter. So oh, it's been, it's been aged twice in two different barrels. It's a maple pecan smoked porter before that. Um, and, and, and just so you know, Keith, uh, right in the, in, in, since you've been talking about this beer, we've gained 10 listeners, uh, on the show live and you're hold you're holding them. The content is like engaging yeah. and you've got so them. This is Keep 11%. Going. Keep going, Keith. This is 11%. Um, which makes it the middle of my three beers, unfortunately. Because <laughs> I've been 10 and a half, 11 and a half, and now 11. Um, but this one, the, the, the double Keith's pecan maple smoke three beers for every porter. beer that we've been having, Dan. Like, this is not even a contest anymore. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to uh-huh. go to the gym today. Like, that is out. I'm, I'm too... Honestly, I'm I will I'll say tonight. this. Um, those people who are watching this on, on YouTube saw me, like drop off and it was just two people on the screen for a second because i had to run to the bathroom yeah mm, running to the bathroom was a um, <laughs> running it was walls, definitely a challenge <laughs> it was a challenge to run <laughs> and not fall <laughs> bill did i miss your beer what are you having uh okay having, so bill? i've got an ale smith brewing company small batch my bloody valentine hoppy red ale and I didn't look this beer up and I don't know anything about it. And I know this was supposed to be our favorites, but it's an hoppy red ale. So it's kind of right in my wheelhouse as far as what I really kind of like and pull off the shelf when I do experiment. And so I'm going to pour it now and look at it. It's yeah, it's really nice. Amber. Totally. So when red. you say hoppy red ale, what comes to mind is kilt lifter by pipe yeah. brewing mm. there in Seattle. Um, when I think of a red ale, I think of men's room red from Elysian. Oh, which was yeah. A huge That's another beer up here really for a long time. One. It was a, yeah, that it was is a really a, good one. It was attached yeah, to a radio strong KSW. Both of those are really good, but yeah. Um, nice. What do you think, Bill? What, yeah, what? no, it's good. It's a little bitter on the, on the tail end, um, <laughs> but it's my third beer. So I'm ready for that now. And it's, uh, it's, it's a good, it's a good taste. So I know you said favorites. I didn't have time to go, you know, sneak out my all-time favorites. Um, but I, I wanted to grab a beer I'd never had before. And so this is my, so this is the Elysian juice dust, juicy Ooh, IPA. Mm, yes. Right. Yes. So I've had that. 8.2% ABV. So mm-hmm. I'm stepping it up. This 73 is the one I didn't, I didn't pull IBUs. Out. Drake's juicy. I might have to, I might nice. that later. Uh, malts are pale rolled oats and honey hops or Chinook Citra and Amarillo. Um, tasting notes, orange guava, ripe tropical fruit and candied citrus. You're going to like that one. Uh, I like um, the color already. Okay. So while, while I have a question talking, for you guys, uh, if yeah, we, go ahead for what I have a non football question for you and I've been inspired by this Are either of you guys, do you do much with TikTok at all? I don't I do, do anything with TikTok entirely because um, my other 
persona you besides value being a life? football person is that of a teacher. And my students are all on TikTok and no. therefore I avoid oh, it yes. yeah, because I don't want to be in that same space as my students. And it's so bad I'm, enough that I'm on Instagram. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've only got one thing to say. Uh -huh. Look at me. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. <laughs> Look at me. I'm 58 years old and I'm on TikTok. So, all right. I'm 50, I got you beat by one year. I'm 59. But I, wait, I will wait, wait, say wait, wait. this. Dan, I, I know say, about Dan, TikTok. Dan, did you say you were 58? I'll be 59 in October. I'll be. That is, all right. God damn, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> if you, like, you being older than me seems absolutely <laughs> crazy. I am 46. I will be 47 in December, and I cannot believe you are older than I am. <laughs> I tell you, uh, for the longest time, I never felt it and took a lot of pride in the fact that nobody ever thought I was my age. But now, like, I feel almost yeah. 60. I decided to grow this out a little bit. My that's the beautiful that. partner reminds me every day that I'm becoming more of a cranky old man with each pass. <laughs> um, hey, how, how about some uh, non-football questions? Oh, so that's so the, I was inspired by TikTok for this because there's there's a trend right now where there's a filter where uh, it blind you, you do blind ratings one through 10 in all these food categories, you know, best fast food restaurants, best, you know, all that. And so uh, I would like to know uh, my question for all three of us would be what's the best. And I know there's some regional differences here. Best fast food burger. Shake Shack. Hop Daddy. See, Hop Daddy is something I've never heard of. Is that a chain? Is that local? It is a chain, and I'm not sure. Because you're in Phoenix, right? Yeah. Just so everybody knows, Keith is in Vancouver, Washington. Mm -hmm. I'm in Seattle. Sh Shake Shack just opened for the first time in Portland. Uh, yeah, right um, next we got Shake Shack to, here as well. Right next to Powell's in downtown. Um, Interesting, they came and, to Seattle before Portland. We, we got ours during the pandemic. But honestly, I've been to Shake Shack twice, and yeah, there's just nothing comparable. I mean, okay, in and outs great. I, I I went to that when I was in Phoenix back when I was going to uh, Mariner Spring Training. Um, I I under, absolutely understand the uh, the love of 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 In and Out, but Shake Shack something different, and to me that. That was great. So, so I'm going to back, had, I'm gonna have to take back Hop Daddy a little bit. They've only got two locations. I thought it was a little bit bigger hmm. than that. All right. So uh, of the bigger type chains that we all might know, what would your next go-to be? You know, I really like Culver's. Um, I don't know if I've you guys are a lot with, about them lately with Culver's, but, um, mm -hmm. and I'm they're not the sure that they're in the, the They do the frozen custard. That's kind of what they're known for. Yeah, too, they're right? kind of like, um, bur what's the burger chain at Burgerville? It's kind of like Burgerville, only it's, yeah, it's kind of like Burgerville, but maybe slightly more Isn't elevated Burgerville with a little bit more Vancouver, choice. Vancouver, Portland? Yes. And not anywhere else? But I'm just trying okay. to say that it's kind of like that, that people might be familiar with in the Northwest, um, whether in Portland or Seattle, but um, it's, it's, it's pretty decent. It's interesting. I, I've only had Shake Shack twice. Once was in Vegas. And then another time I ordered it on DoorDash and that doesn't count because by the time it gets to you, it's lukewarm and you know, you can't really mm -hmm. judge it. Um, I can't remember being blown away by it, but it was also kind of a crazy night and I might've been a little drunk and maybe it didn't enjoy it fully. I would have up until last year, I would have said in and out because every time I've had in and out, uh, in California or Arizona, um, I was always struck by how the burger was so hot and fresh by the time you got your hands on it that I would have to wait to take a bite because it would literally mm -hmm. burn my mouth. And that the burgers are good. To me. But the French fries juicy. there are, are God, the not fries good. are crap. Yeah. It, the fries are crap. Fresh cut fries are so hard to do and they don't do it right. You have to cook them twice and they don't. Um, yeah. But, but the so, last time I was in Arizona for spring training last year, I was – thoroughly underwhelmed by the burger that I got. And it's, it's changed my opinion. Oh, wow, that's it's disappointing. A little bit. Yeah. I would say like it, when I think about, and it's tough because what's fast food versus fast casual, right? Like I don't count. I saw something the other day where somebody was talking about five guys. I think five guys makes a great burger. I don't count that as fast food. If you don't have a drive up window. Yeah. Five guys really is, is food, pretty good, right? but they're not, but they're fast cash. I'll throw a little curveball at you. I'll throw a curveball. 
if I'm my go-to, if I just want to go to a, just a massive chain burger place, some at any given point and grab a burger. Massive chain. Is that the I'm, criteria? Massive chain. Or just recognizable chain. How about that? I'm getting a sourdough Jack. Okay. That is an underrated right? burger. Usually I like lettuce and pickles and all the veggies on my burger, but that burger, every single time I think I've had one, no matter what Jack in the box I've been to in the country, tastes exactly the same. Yep. It's juicy. The tomato, the cheese. It, yeah. Uh, that you is eat it in the car burger. because it doesn't all end up on your shirt. Like it's like sourdough. A, a Wendy, it's Wendy's one double. slice of tomato and it's boom, done. Dave's that, that is an underrated sourdough. burger. Yeah. Yeah. Sourdough Jack. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, okay. So let's get wild and crazy. How about that? Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, who wants to take this wild and crazy question? Ooh, this is delicious, by the way. Okay. I'll take a wild and crazy question. Let's sure. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Um, Just to be, be, be honest about Garnet, I'm having a very difficult time keeping my eyes focused on the screen <laughs> as we talk. <laughs> well, you're, you're next. So I better ask you the, this, the, the next question right after this. Okay. Do you believe the earth, uh, this is for Dan, do you believe the earth is being visited or is oh. currently being occupied by a non-human intelligence with technology that might be superior oh to that of humans? I thought you were going to ask if I thought it was flat, but then that would have probably <laughs> uh, qualified as our politics. Uh, <laughs> non-negotiable. Uh, do I think aliens have visited and are here now? Is that basically Not aliens? The, uh, Oh. No, it doesn't have to be aliens, but non-human intelligence. Like when you, when you say aliens, you think of little green men. I don't want to give yeah. that overall connotation. I'm t non-human intelligence. Like, you know, you've seen kind of the videos, the TikTok videos of uh, the, 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 the um, Air Force and, and Navy pilots describing certain things that yeah. are credible um, that can't be um, either dismissed or identified. I, so I guess there's, I have two answers to that. Number one is from the moment I was born, like I was fascinated with space and just the, the, um, just the, the vast, limitless, endless nature of space. And I would be one of those, you know, cliche kids that would sit out with my buddy, uh, you know, camping out, looking up at the stars and just going, oh, how can space never end? Like just that concept, right? for us to think that we're the only tiny little rock in this entire endless, limitless universe that just happens to be far enough away from a sustainable star and energy source to have life on that planet. And that that life is intelligent and can create technology is ridiculous, right? We're not alone. We're not. And I do think there's some compelling evidence. Some of it comes from the, the U S government themselves. Uh, a few years ago, I, I, I uh, can, I, I still laugh at the bit that Nate Bargetsy did um, on one of his specials during the pandemic when he's like, the, the government came out and told us aliens are real last year. Nobody paid any attention to it. Like nobody cares. But I don't think they're like here among us or any other non-human intelligent life because we would catch them. It's why like I, I grew up thinking they're, you know, Bigfoot was real and the, the, Bermuda Triangle and Noah's Ark and all these like things, but they would, everybody has a cell phone now and we occupy every inch of the planet. What if nothing there's a goes, parallel? Nothing goes if, unguarded. We would What if there's a parallel timeline sort you know, of situation where that. you're kind of like, they come in and out of, of our perception. You know, if you take, if you think about it, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to be serious but also oh playful. i've considered all the, of these questions the, if you if, if like this. humans only have a certain spectrum right of both uh, sonically and visually that we can perceive and is there a potential or possibility that things could be interacting in our world that we just can't quite I certainly perceive. considered it because I have had some deja vus in my life that I just cannot wrap my head around that were so vivid that I knew I had lived this moment before. Right. And so you have to consider some of those things. I just, I just think uh, I'll just go back to my answer in this day and age. It's, it would nearly be impossible for some of that thing, some of that to go undetected, which I just had this debate with somebody 
well, it wasn't a debate because I won, but <laughs> the whole, the whole flat earth thing, just fly. Okay. Get in an airplane and go take a picture of the edge of the earth. And then I'll believe it. And they, they have some bullshit answer for that. That makes no sense at all. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. then, then we're done. Like I, I believe there's intelligent life out there. That's non-human. I tend to believe maybe 60, 40, they've been here before. There's some really compelling historical evidence that something happened a long time ago that seems way advanced and there's evidence of it. Um, but yeah, here now among us, I don't know. Um, Unless my cat is more intelligent than I think he is. And which kinda, is more frightening that we are alone in the universe or that we're not. I think are. I think that that we are the fact that the trillions and trillions and trillions of galaxies that we've seen each having trillions of stars and that any number of them could have planets. The fact that we are the only Mm -hmm. place in all of the existence that would have intelligent life. You're, you're talking about a situation though, where we have our, all of our timelines are lined up and travel and travel is, let's just say, I don't even care about, I'm I'm not talking, I'm not talking about travel. I'm just talking about, you look at all of the fact that we put, we took the Hubble space telescope and we aimed it at the darkest point of, of the space of space. And we left it there for the looking open. at yeah. it with the aperture open for a long time and realized that it was full of galaxies. Yes. Um, and that was the darkest point of space. That was the one point where there looked like there was the most nothing. And it was full of thousands or millions of galaxies, each with trillions and trillions of stars. The idea that we are the only place where ne- where intelligent life has existed seems astronomically impossible. Um, does that mean they've they've traveled and they've been here? I don't know. Yeah, there's there's compelling evidence to say they have. At the same time, there's also compelling evidence to say that it's impossible for them to have been here. No. Given unless, given the physics unless wormholes and, exist or whatever. So yeah. okay. So back to football. Um damn. <laughs> Bill, back to football. <laughs> um so looking ahead to the end of the season, who will lead the team in sacks and pressures? Ooh, I I, I think it's I think it's Leonard Williams. I, I think They've invested so much wow. in him. Wow. Uh, I, I think they've invested so much in him to make him a, fo- a focal point, a foundation of that defensive line that I think, you know, no matter how much development we see from some of the other young players in the front, in the front four or five, front seven, that he's going to be the benefactor of that and that they're going to, he's going to be the guy that they're going to put into position. As much as I, you know, raved about Byron Murphy earlier, I think, I think Leonard Williams is, is in some ways there just in Matabuike where that he's the guy that they're trying to maximize his matchups. Do you think that he's going to have more sacks, more pressures than Byron Murphy? I do. I I don't think it's going to be a massive number. I don't think anyone on this team is, is going to, or maybe is even capable of, double digit sacks, but I could see Leonard having a, a nine or 10 sack season or a bunch of other guys get seven and eight. Um, you know, maybe those outside guys, but I just, I, I, I really think that the the things that Mike McDonald wants to do with this defense to, to confuse offenses. So you don't ever know where a guy's coming from. Do you, I, where, what position I mean, I, do you think that he gets those from the most? He said like he's playing six spots right now. He's, so like, like, but, but is he going to be, a, is it going to become, is that pressure going to come more know. from the I three tech see, spot or the five tech? I could see it coming from the five tech because teams are going to have to account for Byron Murphy. And, mm-hmm. and I, you talked earlier about how he might create things for others, especially his rookie year, you know, in those times that he gets in there, I think he's going to be such a force and he's going to take so much attention away with his dynamic movement skills on the interior, I think Leonard Williams is going to be the biggest benefactor of that and is going to get some sacks or we're going to go, well, Byron Murphy made that happen. 
So Dan, let me ask you a question. Um, because people keep comparing Byron Murphy to Aaron Donald. And I think that's an, I don't, I don't think that I don't agree that that is the great, that that is the best example of a comp. Um, I have been since pre-draft comparing him not to Aaron Donald, but instead to Warren Sapp. What would you oh, I like that. To that? Another kind of undersized guy. Yeah. I, I just think any comparison to Aaron Donald is ridiculous. I don't care how close you are. <laughs> Thank you. And in, you know, physical <laughs> stature, height, weight, you know, measurements, even combine testing. Like he was just such a unique player that yeah. I think it's unfair to compare anyone to that. Um, I, I've heard Grady Jarrett. Um, but yeah, I think Warren Sapp's a good one because again, that strong low base, right? Just that combination mm. of strength at the point of attack and, and foundation and also quickness and, and hand usage. Um, yeah. I, is this, is this yeah. player anywhere in, in the same orbit or similar to Cortez Kennedy, Keith? I know that was one of your favorite players and I, I oh watched him God. certainly, but I, I just forget. Like, what did Cortez weigh though? He was quite a bit bigger, wasn't he? <clears throat> Cortez Kennedy was like three Oh five. Um, he was a bigger guy. But um, man, he, was, he was all but, lower half. But the but thing about called? Cortez Kennedy was that was he existed in a, an era when in which interior defensive tackles living in the backfield as pass rushers and getting 10 sacks was absolutely unheard of. And yet that's what he did. That's why he's a Hall of Famer. He's literally like the, he was a transcendent player in that he changed the way we viewed a defensive tackle. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's true. He's, he's, he's one of my top of three players of all time and uh, with the Seahawks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's been a worse. There's been a lot of, I don't know if we want to get into this or not, but there's been a lot of just cause it's the kind of the, the time of year it, it sort of lends itself to this, but a lot of uh, Mount Rushmore talk lately. Well, and it's mm -hmm. because the NFL came out and did it too. I think that spurred a lot of this on, but do we want to talk about that? Like who sure. your guys yeah. is talk. Mount it's Rushmore of Seahawks be? I mean, my, it would, that's pretty easy. I mean, you start with um, Steve Largent and then you go with Cortez Kennedy and Walter Jones and there's your three out of your four and they're all yeah. hall of famers. And then yeah, who but who's you your fourth? As, that's kind of where the debate comes into. Cause a yeah, lot of the, people the only the debate on that shows up is where do you, what do you do with number four? And there's some pretty good options right. there. I mean, um, you gotta, you gotta consider. Yeah, you're right. Keith, go ahead. I was going to it's going to straight up and say Richard Sherman because, um, absolute first ballot hall of famer, um, face of the franchise kind of guy and just dominant in a way that was different than the way other people players were dominant. He changed um, the position. He really did. Yeah, I mean, he went, for, uh, the position went from they're looking for guys that were five ten and, and shifty to guys that were, you know, six, one, six, two and, and could, could run. Cause he was six, four. Nobody and, talked uh, about our Richard names Sherman changed the position. Came yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, elite in ways that no one ever envisioned a cornerback being elite. So to me, he's my fourth, but there's plenty of other guys. I mean, um, a lot Bobby of people want to Russell now. Bobby, Bobby's a tough one to Bobby Wagner, mm -hmm. Russell Wilson, Sean Alexander, Marshawn Jacob Lynch. Green had over a hundred. Jacob packs. Green is another, is a great one too. Um, you know, there's there, God, there's so many different guys. Um, Kenny easily is a guy that absolutely deserves. If he'd played five more years, it'd be our Mount Rushmore would be the easiest. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and you know, Earl and, Thomas, but even right. Kenny easily the, like, the five more years he, in a Seahawk uniform, Earl Thomas would be a hall of famer. And Kenny easily five more years. He was, he was denied those five years because of the NFLs at the time they were handing out anti-inflammatories NSAIDs like candy mm -hmm. and they just destroyed his kidneys. Yeah. And literally yes. they destroyed I think about his that every time I take ibuprofen. Yeah. I me too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, maybe I should only take two. So let me ask you this guys, what do you think about cam chancellor in this conversation? God, Cam Chancellor to me shows up as the number five or six guy. 
but he's absolutely up there more so than Talk you about mentioned Earl Thomas. A position. Yeah. You mentioned Earl Thomas to me, Cam Chancellor fits before Earl Thomas because of his leadership, because of his um, ownership of that spot on the team where he was the, not just the enforcer for other teams, teams come across the middle, but he was the enforcer (laughs) of keeping guys in line and you have a responsibility to your teammates and we are going to hold you to that. That is what Cam Chancellor represented. I would submit he he set the tone for that Super Bowl, (laughs) Super Bowl 48 with that hit on Demarius Mm -hmm. Thomas. Oh my goodness. Play of the game, I think. Um, I think he also, I think he changed Vernon Davis's career. Like, I do. No, I do. yes. Then Vernon Davis retired early after seven seasons. Yeah. Vernon Davis retired after seven seasons, I think, uh, uh, off my memory. But, right? He, like, there was a trajectory. One of the great athletes to ever play the tight end position. Just and like, and it on changed athlete. that he was day. never the same. When you saw the um, all of the, the, the sweat in slow motion fly off his body. Yeah. Yeah. It, you, you know the picture I'm talking about, right? Yeah. That yeah. That moment where it was flagged for an illegal hit was proven in slow motion to not be was so violent that yeah. I didn't even mind the flag because it was like, <laughs> it, it, it literally ruined a, a human being and no disrespect, you know, intended at all for this, but Vernon Davis was never ever the same after that timid watched. He had ghosts. He saw ghosts. Yeah. Dude. And one of the most too. one of the most compelling um, conversations that we had doing that all time team last week was that you know if you break it down to free safety strong safety <clears throat> like Cam's not he's not the best strong safety in Seahawks history because it's Kenny Easley like that's mm-hmm. how good Kenny Easley was yeah but but yet it was so different but he this this is what a freak Kenny Easley was he technically played strong safety on those teams. John Harris was the free safety. And yet in a two year span, Kenny easily had seven picks and 10 picks in one defensive player of the year. He had 17 interceptions in two years from the strong safety position. He was just as capable of, of covering as he was of coming up and laying the lumber. And it's like, that's how good Kenny easily was that cam chance are one of the great strong, strong safeties in this league's history is the second best one we've had. Yeah. I would agree with that. Absolutely. But it's close. It's, you know, it's close because of the longevity and sadly, both of them, both of their careers ended early, you know? Well, the fact that, that, that Ronnie Lott of all people came out and said that Kenny easily was the best strong safety he's ever seen play and Mm -hmm. deserved to be in the hall of fame. Ronnie freaking Lott. Yeah. Was the one campaigning for Kenny Easley to get in the hall. So game. Can, can we talk I've had Paul about Moyer on the show? That, and he and he says Kenny Easley is the best football player he's ever played with. Period. So can we talk about yeah. something that we hardly ever talk about, which is, and we don't go very much past Pete Carroll and Mike Holmgren in the coaching history of, of the Seahawks very often, but I think you know you talk about Chuck Knox coming into this team and, and coach these guys that we're talking about, mm-hmm. um, and giving the Seahawks, their relevance for the very first time as a, as a franchise. Um, and all three of us, I think were around Well, you started your fandom, Keith, when Chuck Knox was the coach, correct? It's true. I don't, I was young. I was only like seven or eight, but that 84 season when, um, Kurt Warner got hurt and Mm. they had to go air, air Chuck instead of ground Chuck. Uh, that was the year in which I became, a Seahawk fan. I did not know what I was watching, but it was fun and I would never look back. Um, that was the year. So yeah, yeah. Chuck, Chuck Knox has a lot four. to do with. They went 13 and yeah. four with no Kurt Warner. With no Kurt Warner. And the year before was, it was the most fantastic finish to a playoff game I'd ever seen in my life where Largen Miami. caught that pass at the end uh, of that game from was um, that the Miami game. Yes, the Miami game in Miami mm-hmm. against Dan Marino and and Dan, um, not Dan, um, uh, Craig, David Craig, Dave, yep, was the was the quarterback. You know, succeeded um, Jim Zorn, and 
uh, made that that desperate throw at the end where in in true largent form spun him around and was wide open you know and and put that position team in a position to win that game and we when we won and, and the the exhilaration i mean this was all on tv at the time because you you know team we just didn't travel at that point you know for games and so forth right. and we didn't have any history as a franchise we didn't have any success this Ooh. was the first time we were like tasting any success at all and uh and we won that and i just remember the the feeling was very similar to that first game we won against the Panthers to get into the first Super Bowl, mm -hmm. um, where five, it, it, where you just felt this like overwhelming sense of pride and and all the effort you put in with Bill the Beer Man, trying to get the crowd going right at the at the home games oh and all God. the energy and all the really things great. and and you willed this team from nothing like yeah. Jack Patera nothing to a winning franchise was just the greatest feeling ever as a fan um, to, to kind of grow up with that and then finally taste that success. That's why I always liked Chuck Knox, man, because he, he brought that gravitas to the mm -hmm. franchise that we'd never had before, before then. It's so just, fun. To, go ahead. It's so fun to, to look back and see, you know, kind of give some context to what actually was happening back there and trying to reconcile it with what your memory is and also see how the game has changed. Right. So Kurt Warner has the dynamic rookie season, right? looks like he's on his way all time career. Mm -hmm. He can do anything. You just hand him the ball and, and, and he goes right. Strength, power, quickness, all of those things would have gone down. I think if he hadn't gotten hurt is one of the great running backs of all time, but, but you know, medicine wasn't then what it is now. And that ACL injury, he, he was never the same. Well, and the Seattle, um, the kingdom of just a very thin layer of oh, astroturf on concrete on top. Yeah. It was terrible. Jesus was Christ. Really I terrible. can't believe they played. Football I, I played, I played on that field. Oh, God, for, that's crap. And, and yeah, it was, it was not good. So then, so then, you know, they, they changed the offense. Basically they, they lean on Dave Craig his full first full year as a starter. So he throws for, this is, this is crazy. Like he throws for 36, uh, 3,671 yards. In 84 and 85, he followed it up with 3,600. Again, that would be nothing by today's standards. Yeah, but, in that era. But, yeah, right. In 84, in that he era, throws, they were huge. They were massive he threw 32 numbers. 32 touchdowns in 84 and 27 touchdowns in 85. So 59 total touchdowns over two seasons. Can either of you tell me how many interceptions he threw over those same <laughs> two just seasons? I going to ask that question. How many interceptions did he have? Or how many fumbles 44. did he have? Fumbles, 44. fumbles. Are, how many fumbles 44, did he have? Forty-four interceptions. Think he about went, that. You would have been benched in, in eighty-four. In they won age. thirteen games, and he threw twenty-four picks to thirty-two touchdowns. We're so hyper focused now on interceptions that you know, I don't know. Like there, there are people that think Sam he Howell probably is dropped the ball because the he threw seventeen last year too, year, right? Like, yeah. It's insane. He threw a hundred. He threw two hundred sixty-one touchdowns in his career to one hundred ninety-nine interceptions. And, and he's the all-time leader in fumbles in the NFL. Yeah. Is he still an all-time leader in fumbles? All-time. Yeah, does he leader. still lead in that? I should. Probably. I believe he. Yeah. He's top uh, I don't ten think in he, a lot of different categories. If you go look at him, like honestly, he's top I don't 10 think in a Dave lot of Craig, different Dave Craig's fumble. Um, stat i don't believe his record i don't believe will ever be broken okay here we go it's he one of those have had eight inch eight inch hands wait uh, it's, like kenny kenny nope, pickett it has hands. been broken it has he is now he is currently third with 153 <laughs> fumbles in the nfl and the top two any guesses one stopped playing in 2000 and one stopped playing in 2010 and the one that stopped playing in 2000 is also a former seahawk uh, I would have never gotten either of these on a trivia. Jerry Rice. Warren Moon. Warren Moon, number two, 161 fumbles in his career, but number one wow. with 166 fumbles granted over a Man. over an almost 1991 to 2010. So almost a 20 year career. Dave Craig played for 20 years. So, uh, but Brett, Brett Favre. Brett Favre. As wow. once I knew Brett he Favre was long. up there as far as total longer. turnovers. I did longer. not realize yeah. it was number that number of fumbles. Because yeah. with Craig, it was it was definitely like it felt like that that record was never going to be broken because not just because that the the NFL had changed 
and that turnovers were such a big deal and that teams yeah. would not accept that level of fumbles and turnovers. But think about you this, this dude. Think about, oh, but wait, 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 wait. Think about this dude, Mudbone. Like, he's amazing. <laughs> like, like when you really think about him, like his place in Seahawks lore, it's like he came in after Jim Zorn. Nobody, at the time, nobody thought anybody could replace Jim Zorn because Jim Zorn was everyone's fan favorite. He was good right. looking. He was, you know. And then here comes this kid from Milton College, right? That is like a total underdog. And he comes in, he wins the job. And, and Chuck Knox wasn't going to hand that job you know, without reason won that job. And he, he just kind of, he was one of those guys that had definite shortcomings and he pissed you off a lot. You mentioned the interceptions, like mm -hmm. you would be driving and he would throw the ball at the most in, in an opportune time to kill drives, et cetera. But somehow, and we had this defense, right? Where, where you had John Harris and, um, and all those guys, those defensive backs were just tremendous. The the linebacking group was was tremendous in that in that defense. And somehow or another, he willed that team to win. It's like he kind of put the he was the first quarterback I saw as a, as a kid growing up that put a team other than like Fran Tarkington. And I know I date myself; I go way back. But <laughs> that put a team on his back and and like yeah. kind of just willed them to win and he, and that was him and and, and so I got to give him some props for that. The kind of he's the kind of quarterback that could never he would never even be given an opportunity in today's NFL because he didn't he wasn't big enough, strong enough. He didn't have a strong enough arm. He didn't throw a tight spiral, right? Like a bunch of different arm angles, wobbly ball. He was just kind of a backyard sort of. He's just the guy that made plays. But he inherited Steve Largent. Yeah, mm -hmm. that helped. He's 30, well, wait, wait, wait. He is currently on the all, he's 27th all time in uh, in NFL history in passing yards. Yeah. That was like 44,000 or 40, 48,000. Coming from an era 30, where, where you, where. 38. Coming from an era where teams were running the ball, like passing yards did not matter. They did not equate to NFL wins. Yeah. And yet he's still 27th overall ever, yeah. ever, yeah. which is nuts. Yeah. And, and like Seahawkers podcast just, just said, I think he was top 10 when he retired. He's ahead of guys like, uh, this is, this is fun. He's ahead of Boomer Esiason, and Donovan McNabb, uh, Jim Kelly. He's ahead of mm. Tony Romo is 39th. Mm. He's ahead of wow. Troy Aikman, uh, hall of famer. He's ahead of Steve Young. Hall of Famer. He's ahead of Kurt Warner, Hall of Famer. Um, Can you imagine with, the, with, with what you're just saying, with the right team in the right circumstance, he would have been a, a Super Bowl champion. He was he was oh, that yeah. level of quarterback where he could have led a team to a Super Bowl with the right situation. Well, you look at when he left, when he finally left Seattle, um, and, and Seattle was left with a mess when he oh god it was got, it got dark after that dan, dan mcguire got really dark. etc but <laughs> right but when he left look what did he do he went to um kansas city and continued to win yeah yeah he was very dave or a matt hasselbeck-esque like he was just a very solid quarterback and yeah hey yeah. how are you guys doing on time you guys okay? Another 15 uh, minutes? Uh, yeah. Another 15, I'm 20? Okay. I'm good. I'm struggling <laughs> to... I am struggling to remain upright. Uh, I, I, wanna... I got a question for you, Dan. Yeah. Uh, you play guitar, yes? Uh, haven't touched them in a while, but um, sure. I... <laughs> Do you ever play, play in a band? No. No. no, so this is just kind of a hobby thing. I used to get together with a buddy of mine who also played guitar and jam and stuff. But yeah, it's like nice. no, it's so. I, talk I, to I me about to, your music, to, though. What like I used you to love do is music. Just, yeah, I would just sit for hours and e learn things by ear and teach myself things on the guitar and play along with things. Like that's that was my that's, kind of that's me in a nutshell. And, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, I I I am convinced that that there are some skills in this lifetime that if you don't attend and there are obviously um exceptions to every rule but if you don't 
get into them or attempt them early enough in the development of your brain, you never have a chance to be great at it. And I think guitar is one of those things and many musical instruments. I think you have to, um, you have to be introduced to it before you understand how hard it is. And by the time, <laughs> by the time I decided I wanted to learn how to play guitar, I was in college and I already had that little voice in my head that was like, that's too hard. You, you'll never, be, you can't do what he's doing. You can't, you know, so you just try to learn the basics and, uh, and then I would work at it every single day and I got kind of good at it, uh, in some respects, but, um, it's such a mental block that it's just, you have to be able to play free and easy. And the people that make it look easy, it's because when they learned it, they didn't know how hard it was. And mm -hmm. I think that applies to a lot of things, but now they're just decorations on the wall. I, you know, I always vow to myself, I'm going to start playing again, but I just, you know, life is 24 hours is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> so true. It's not enough. As a guy with, with multiple guitars, um, I will tell you that I agree. Um, I wanted to learn when I was younger and bought a guitar and played until my fingers bled all over it. And oh, then exactly. realized I had Good to stop. Yeah. I had to stop and, and let my hands heal. But when I let it, when I stopped, let my hands heal, I stopped for too long. Yeah. And then it became one of those things where I'd pick it up every few years and learn a little bit and then have to and put it away. You used to be able to play really easily. You can't play anymore. You're like, yeah. what happened to that? And so now I've got, um, now I've got two guitars and, and a uke and, and I don't really, I don't consider myself someone who can, who knows how to play. No. Um, but I want to, and I say the I'm same thing about guitars play. that I do about golf. I, I, sometimes play guitar, but I'm not a guitar player. And I think there's a delineation to be made. I mean, my, now my one pride and joy, and I don't know if you can see it is I do have a, uh, Paul Reed Smith, Mark Tremonti signature nice. edition, uh, Les Paul version in, uh, nice. in Starburst red that uh, just Mark, Mark actually signed. Tremonti. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, he was touring with, uh, oh, what's the, what's the kid from American Idol? Oh, Daughtry. Last year. Daughtry. Yeah, I was yeah. touring with Daughtry. Yeah, yeah. It was a fun yeah. show. Yeah, I play I play the drums just Ooh. you know for uh for fun. I've got a Roland T D fifty. You were it's telling me that. So now yeah, that it's a, is it's a nice pro kit, but I picked it up when I was fifty four. Mm -hmm. And you hadn't played um, drums before? No, just the spoons. Okay. Yeah, so, wooden spoons and pans. Yeah, and my cousin though is a pro drummer, and I, mm. so I've got there's there's some jeans things going on there, so I can keep yeah. a basic beat. So I, I I I have that as a foundation, and then all the rest is complete crap because I haven't ever learned how to do even <laughs> paradiddles or fills or anything yeah. else, and so I can I can play along with. In fact, my favorite genre to play along with is smooth jazz because mm -hmm. um, they have a really mm. nice just solid beat backbeat on the back end yeah. that isn't so mm -hmm. fill oriented and so forth. So I don't have to worry about like being a complete rock out drummer. I can just kind of fill that beat and, and it's kind of uh, fun to play with. But other than that, it, it's complete, just fun. Yeah. I do have a drum story. And so when I was young from fifth grade until 10th grade, I played drums and I was always first chair. I was very good at it. But, but the problem when you were in, elementary school and then junior high school band is uh, it was kind of the Peter principle. Like I was, because I was first chair, they always gave me the most challenging assignments. And so I, I would be assigned to play timpani or, you know, first snare because that was where the, that was the value. Right. So the third and fourth chair dudes were learning how to play a drum set. And so, because they were never called upon to get the the key the key roles in any symphony we were composing or any show we were getting ready for, and so I never learned to coordinate my feet and and my playing ability. So in high school, I went to the very first day of marching band practice. They handed me a set of tri toms, and I just it just didn't excite me, and I walked away from it. But to this day, like my brain is, and when you mentioned the rolling thing before we started recording, like I've told. I've told my partner, like someday when we're not living in an apartment, we have a garage or something or a downstairs, like I'm getting a drum set because I still, to this <laughs> nice. day, not a day yeah. goes by. I'm not tapping on something like that's my brain and how it's wired. Yeah. Like well, I next still time you're in I Phoenix, have, let me know. I'll let you yeah. come over. 
Oh, it'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I need to get a, we can jam, a kid we can jam who together. is a percussionist in, you know, uh, he's middle school. So he's middle school band and he's a percussionist. And I'm just like, you tell me, you give me the word and I will buy you the drum set in any no, day. You just can get it on up. Amazon. You give me the word, you now. give me the word yeah. and it will be in your bedroom. Um, and he keeps telling me no, and I don't get it. Um, and to the point where I'm like, you decide you want to do that. And I will take up the bass. Like I, I've got my guitars, whatever, but I will learn. I will pay someone to teach me how to play the mm -hmm. bass to his drum set. Yeah. Um, so That's that we fun. can jam together and, you know, find some guitar. I got a couple of friends that are like, you know, they know how to play way better than I do on the, on the guitar. And I'm like, you know, we'll get, we'll get Tyler over here and, and Caleb can play the bass and I'll play the, or he'll play the um, drums and I'll play the bass and, and, and Tyler play and we'll jam. And I'm yeah, like, dude, just like you stuff. just, you give me, just tell me, just tell yeah. me when you're ready and we'll do it. And he keeps telling me, no, I'm hmm. like, what the fuck's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you just you know, gotta make certain, it show up. Certain you level, just gotta get it to show up. Yeah. Yep. He, yeah, you have to want to, or it's not going to happen. And, mm -hmm. and, um, but I also think people's brains are wired differently. Like I think my brain was wired more as a drummer. Like to this day, when I go to shows, it's kind of what draws my eye and I, I look for the drummer. So, so I get a question for you. So, um, yeah. based up, based on that, I probably already know the answer, but are you more of a production and quality, pr uh, producers, um, sort of have mindset or are you more of a lyrics guy? Oh, I'm production and melody. Like yeah. I, I, so when I you go to a thing. show, you don't even hear the lyrics. You're just, you're in it to like hear I'm the, just, the <laughs> lyrics right. are secondary, I've taken, dude. <laughs> I've taken so much shit from this, uh, about this too. from, from people that I've been with in my life in relationships where like, I will literally love a song for a decade and not know <laughs> what it means. What lyrically. <laughs> and then someone points it out to me. I'm like, Oh, that's kind of weird. Like I'm, it's about melody yeah. and hook to me. And, yeah. and does it draw me in and catch me? And um, the, the, I've also been caught doing this at times where I'm like, hey, this song reminds me of you. <laughs> Send it off because of the chorus. And then you find out that the verses are like completely wrong and a totally different <laughs> message. And they're mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, what? So no, I'm all about hooks and, and, and the song. Has yeah, my musical it. background will, yeah, will, 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 will tell you that I, like for me, it's it's about, everything but the lyrics so the lyrics are secondary they're um, a bonus everything though. else the lyrics yeah they are they are a bonus they can be great but yeah. you you can have shitty ass lyrics but well, have I something that's oh, that's legitimately the most memorable songs of all yeah. time i will say especially, just though and you guys know this musical. when you're yeah when, when you're Our growing garbage. up like you remember fuck, the lyrics from the songs from the 70s and 80s this the stuff that you kind of grew up on Right. But you can't remember lyrics if it was to save your life right now. Like it's it's just kind of a weird thing. Okay, um, so I know these are kind of cliche slightly, but um, I'm really curious because I want to get to know you guys better. Because you know that's what this show is all about, mm -hmm. right? That that right, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What's your what's your Viewers favorite? To get to know us better. <laughs> what's your? Give me your top five movies of all time, both of you guys. Oh Ooh. fuck. Just off the cuff, um, just, you know, you give me one and then maybe trade back and forth just so you guys don't have to try to figure it out. The out. first movie that came to mind when you said that was The Princess Bride. It's fun. It's quotable. <laughs> that's, that's it's a silly. Movie. Um, top five. Yeah. But I just saw a, live, I, I saw a live puppet show. I kid you not. <laughs> what? I saw a live <laughs> puppet show Stop like it. two months ago of The Princess Bride. <laughs> and it was adult only. <laughs> My name is Inigo. It was adult only, uh, adult <laughs> puppet show. I and we had Prepared drinks prior, not. and dude, I never laughed my ass off so much in my life. Oh, uh, that's I'm glad you brought that up because that that's one I might have forgotten about, but it's got to be in my top five. I mm -hmm. it's hard for me not to think of sports movies first. Um, God, but the sports movies are usually so bad. Oh, but I'm yeah. such a huge, like it, for many, many years, and it would still probably be in my top five overall movies of all time. For many years, my favorite sports movie is Bull Durham. I just think it's a Bull piece Durham of is, is cinematic is, brilliance. It's a love yeah. story and a sports story. Some of the greatest dialogue and casting ever, uh, despite the fact that it looks like Nuke Lelouch actually throws <laughs> 50 miles an hour and not 100. 
Um, but Moneyball has overtaken it. And and that's just that to me, Moneyball is is one of those movies where it has some of the most realistic dialogue in any movie I've ever seen, where it actually feels like you're sitting in as a fly on the wall and watching people actually talk where every sentence isn't perfectly constructed and playing off of each other, that it's sometimes there's awkwardness and silences and you're talking over each other and trying to figure things. Love that movie. So two, um, two movies that I have to admit, I've never seen Moneyball oh, and, really? and the draft movie. What, what's the, so the, that's a guilty uh, pleasure. It's, I watch it yeah. every year. It's, well, it's a, there's so many things that are bad about that movie. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. It's, it's also kind of awesome in a lot of ways. Like, <laughs> you know, my, my, my two favorite fan, movies. So no. We can do no wrong in my eyes, but. My two favorite movies are comedies. And I'm I'm not a huge comedy movie guy because mm. I always find them so disappointing, mostly. But okay. two movies that end up rising to the top of my list all the time are Airplane and Spinal Tap. Oh, I wondered but if you were I don't know. There's like, something about those, two, I was this, those things. Just it, they get me. Like those yeah. movies get me. My 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 sense of humor. I do love uh, that kind of humor. I think what's brilliant about Airplane is just the writing, just the mm-hmm. way you can write a line. And it just rolled. Different, it's different it's than so you're expecting easy. it to be. Yeah. 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 Keith. Um, well, movies that jump in. Uh, you you talk about comedies. Um, like good morning Vietnam just jumps out as mm. like, God, it's freaking funny up front, but then it's so poignant and so meaningful on the back end. Like that movie just jumps out to me as, as, as one of my favorite and just one of the most tremendous movies. And then the net, the other one that comes to mind is actually animated. It's um, called princess Mononoke by mm. um, Miyazaki. And, um, and, uh, yeah, like that's, that's just another one of those that, that just jumps out. It's like, it's classic. It's absolutely classic. And I think anyone that hasn't seen it should, um, you'll enjoy it. And, um, I'll say this, you know, when you say comedy, the first thing that popped in my mind was Anchorman. And that's just one of my all time favorite classics and (laughs) and just such great characters, like the characters they created for that movie was unbelievable. And it was kind of from the golden age of comedies. There was about a five or six year run. Where you can get away with shit that you couldn't get away with anymore. So much volume. Mm -hmm. You could go to the theater every couple of months and see a great comedy. Um, Godfather. I mean, you know, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. You know, Godfather, Pulp Fiction, those ones belong. Heat. But I will say this: something like else heat. occurred to me, and I think I've named four, so this would be my fifth. As I have to stay true to this, I remember going to see a movie a couple of years ago because I was thinking, like, has anything come out recently? A couple of years ago, I went to see a movie, and I thought I was blown away by it. And went two weeks later, I went back and saw it again. I was still blown away by it. And I remember thinking at that time, as I was watching that movie, this is one of the greatest movies I've ever seen visually the writing, the story, everything else just it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. And that was Top Gun Maverick. When that movie came out, mm. I thought it topped anything in the action genre that had come out in the last 20 years. Wow. And uh, when you couple it with the expectations and how unrealistic some of them were that they could ever come close to topping one of the most iconic movies, you know, in, in the last 40 years. And they, and they did the way that they did. Like I have to, I have to put that one on the list too. I have to stay true. How about, how about TV series? Ooh, that's a fun one. Ooh, that, yeah, that's a fun one because of, of, um, there's so many different layers oh, there. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite genre? I oh, can't I even, I mean, a great comedy, but those are yeah, so hard to sitcom. find. Yeah. Or stand up. I will tell you the wor- the the best series with the worst ending was How I Met Your Mother. Mm. Like that, that was you didn't like him walking out of the empty apartment like that. I thought like that, that was, was a crazy. that was a tremendous series, and then the last couple episodes were absolute trash. That just ruined four years or five years of character development. Like it was yeah, just I like Lost oh, for I like God, Lost for the same reason. Lost was great at building characters, but there were so many questions, and the the ending yeah. was kind of screwed up yeah you know i'll say this endings are so tough they're it, it's almost they impossible really to write a perfect ending for a, a tv series did you and, watch and it not, succession? And not many tv series get the privilege of being able to write a series finale a lot of them are canceled like after the fact right right yeah 
like Seinfeld's a perfect example. To me, that's the top five all time show. Like I was a huge Seinfeld fan. I know it's not for everybody, but like there's still even those guys, even Larry David and, and Jerry still kind of argue and joke about how bad the ending was to this day. I don't care. It didn't tarnish the show. Right. Well, when you do one off episodes that don't relate to the other one, I yeah. mean, they do, but you know, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned lost to me that that's in my top five. Absolutely love that series. And, and I wasn't as upset about the ending as some people because it me was neither, a me mythical neither. show anyway. Yes. Like what, right. what was, it was the perfect a, for ending? me, it was the perfect ending, but yeah. you really had to dig deep to understand what it was all about. And, and, and since for then me, I've read, I liked it so much. Yeah. Yeah. I've read analysis of it since then where I was like, Oh, I didn't look at it that way, you know? Um, but some of the other series that popped to mind just for how great the character uh, casting was and the, the acting and the writing uh, justified with Timothy Oliphant, who's one of my favorite not, actors. Not of heard of that. It was nope. unbelievable. Uh, and then the Friday night light series um, mm -hmm. I thought was so well shot and produced and cast and yeah. realistic. And um, but just, just it was cinematic art. I think you Break, should also breaking need bad to, was like that for me. Breaking mm. bad, um, which I have a, um, I have a, a love hate relationship with breaking bad. Yes. It's great. Um, I'm also a chemistry teacher. <laughs> my, my day job. And in, in that sense, I fucking right. hate that show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a love hate relationship with it too. Cause I've seen it and I want to see it again. But my my significant other will not watch that show, so yeah. I have forevermore. Yeah. I'm kind of regulated to. Yeah. Have, has she seen um, Better Call Saul? She has not. She's, will... she's anti-violence in mm. in watching shows because it triggers like things in her brain, and she has a hard time sleeping. Ultimately, what are you guys watching right now? Like, are either of you watching anything kind of regularly or like it, your go-to when you're just like, I want to burn a couple hours. I don't want to commit to a movie. I'm just going to put this show on right now. No, I actually, no. right at this moment, I don't have a show. I, I um, have just been I'm watching. That uh, 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 I am rewatching Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Um, from years ago, which. I've um, been watching yeah. a show called Feeding Phil on um, Netflix. And it follows Phil, which is a, a, a guy that used to be the head writer of um, Everybody Loves Raymond. Mm -hmm. And this guy is kind of kind of a quirky personality. And he, he goes, travels around all over the world, different city, every show. And he, he immerses into the culture and he talks about different uh, things to eat, different places to eat, different foods, different the the so the 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 eating the quality of the food the visual the mm. entertaining cultural aspect of it where he kind of talks to people that are you know in a different language and he has a translator and and he's just really into it it's a fantastic show i would highly recommend it so are you watching the bear no so i just started season three just came out i just watched episode one realized it's going to take some emotional investment. I'm going to have to be in a certain mood. Uh, the bear is high, high, high quality TV. And as someone that's been in the hospitality business for 30 years, the restaurant business, I can say it's the most surprisingly, I, I'm surprised there isn't more in this genre. That's, that's well done. So the it's title the, doesn't, doesn't tell the story. What's the deal. It's about a, it's about a, uh, a chef who was classically trained, uh, but he grew up in Chicago and his brother, had a tiny little sandwich shop and his brother died unexpectedly and he came back to help save the shop. And so he's trying to like apply everything he's learned, like in France, like as a, as a, like a Michelin star chef to this little shop. And it is the most realistic to the point that it triggers my, like a PTSD response sometimes uh realistic depiction of the hospitality and restaurant business that I've ever seen in cinema on TV or, or movies. It's fantastic. It's Where's it streaming? Right it's on Hulu. Hulu. Um, somebody, uh, Seahawkers mentioned Ted Lasso. I yeah. probably would have put that in my top. I, saw just, that. I like Ted Lasso. Just feel good, great, great feel character. Good just, yeah. Right now good, I'm watching good, out of whatever, good, whatever you were suffering writing. from that day. Yeah, oh, it was perfect away. timing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was the perfect timing for that show to be out there. Mm -hmm. Um, right now I'm, I'm watching and I watched it a little bit when it was on, 
uh, but now I'm like almost done with all eight seasons is uh, Brooklyn nine, nine, which like might be the, <laughs> the last really, really well written spot on comedy series. Yep. Andy seen Samberg. The, the, um, I've been, it's one of those things where and Andy Samberg is one of the true creative minds uh, of the entertainment industry in the last 20 years. And you He's go look great. at, yeah. at, um, the Lonely Island songs that they did that are all <laughs> right. on on YouTube now, and mm-hmm. I've been trying to, I've been trying to slowly introduce my students because I teach high school, um, to, to some of them, which they're wildly inappropriate for, <laughs> for that kind. Yeah, you're not going to start uh, them off with dick in a box. <laughs> no, I was thinking more along the lines of, uh, of threw it on the ground and and I'm on a boat, but, um, <laughs> but. They're, they're still wildly inappropriate, but they're goddamn like yeah. just the creativity and just the unique perspective on things and just the ability to just um, write something that no one else would um, it, for Andy Samberg. And that's what comes through in, in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Like, so I've left, yeah. I've left the best for last. I'm going right. to, I'm going to allow uh, Kristen to take us out of this thing with some rapid fire stuff. Okay. She's got some questions she needs answered. Um, and we're going to try to do, do Rapid that fire. to our Let's best. All right. Here we go. Uh, yep. We kind of hit on this before, but here's her first question. What's your favorite movie? Come on. Rapid fire. Let's go. Uh, Moneyball. Um, Princess Bride. This is Final Tap. Okay. What are your hobbies outside of football? Dan. Oh God, does podcasting count? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. That's it, right? Uh, yeah, that, that That's would be kind of what That's, we have in common together. A legitimate side gig now that takes up uh, most of my, uh, but I, I also like to work out and cook. Ooh, I, I like the cooking um, part. I turn pens and other things on my lathe. I brew beer and um, wow. I have recently started writing a book. Your lathe. Nice. I mean, um, you also blow up shit when I was in high school. Come I on, wait, shit, hold that, on. But, Let's but talk that's about not, Keith that's that a, blows up shit. That's not a wait, hobby. What? That's my, that's my job. Keith blows um, up shit for his job. Okay, let's talk about that. Wait, I want to. I want to see the reader, the, the the viewer count go up as he talks. That's not a hobby. Okay. He gets paid for that. Yeah, I get paid for that. It's not a hobby. That's part of my job. Okay, Unib- um, Unibomber. Let's let's go. What do you got? Um, no. So I teach chemistry, and my job is to make chemistry interesting, which chemistry sucks. Um, and so, therefore, anyone that that um, has has memories of him chemistry being absolutely boring you're not alone so i blow up um things like pure sodium and put it in water and watch it blow up i make colored fire i make <laughs> you're fireballs not supposed to give out, out of, the formula dude you're just supposed to make I, it happen i make random things happen <laughs> like um i make purple fire with um potassium permanganate and um glycerol you, Nothing haven't, you like, haven't showed me that video yet <laughs> yeah they're all on youtube uh, um, I, um, I will, oh, we have a whole day, which is pyromaniac day where we do all sorts of stuff like making, um, gummy bears scream, um, which is fun and, in a whole bunch of pink fire. And, um, I love God how excited damn. you are. I wish you were excited right. like this about Seahawks football. <laughs> I'm the enthusiasm is Seahawks football. palpable, but I, uh, <laughs> this is, this is my job. My job is to figure out ways to take really boring shit and make it interesting to kids. And, um, I take it's it seriously. Kind of what I do on the podcast. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Next question. Uh, Beatles or Rolling Stones? Ooh. The Beatles with the exception of one song. Um, and that would be, um, paint it black by the stones. Like there's something about that song that is just, so fucking good. I'm going to call myself out on this. I would have probably up until five or six years ago would have answered Rolling Stones. And I had long um, maintained that the Beatles are one of the o- most overrated, you know, great bands of all time. I thought wow, their music, really? I thought their music was kind of basic and simplistic. And, and I have since watched a bunch of stuff, a bunch of documentaries, and really come to understand 
how ahead of the curve they were and their genius mm-hmm. in songwriting and the and in and, and the process and how they they worked together as as very very different individuals with very different musical ideas but they were able to combine it and come up with the stuff that they came up with um they are uh i have now come to recognize them as the legends that they are so i would say i love them both got to see you you mentioned vancouver or bc place i got to see uh the rolling stones on their steel wheels tour so maybe they're prime right nice. like that mm-hmm. tour yeah at nice. bc place and, and fantastic uh, and they're still going strong it's amazing at their age but uh but i'd, I'd have to say beatles yeah, for me, it's the Beatles because it's the foundation. Like everything mm-hmm. else is off of that. Mm-hmm. Like if you go and, and you're talking to like, pick a musician, uh, and you ask them about influences and so forth. And even if it it transcends uh, generations or genres, and a lot of folks will, will point back to this. And, you know, you can say the Rolling Stones, but let's be honest, there's really... 10 or 15 top songs that everyone knows. Right. But the Mm -hmm. Beatles, the foundation there is so deep. It's like 40 songs, 50 songs deep. And it's it, 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 at the time you have to take it in the context. It's like football stats and football stuff in the time that it, it was existing. It transcended, um, the, 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 the industry in that it it created sounds Mm -hmm. and, lyrics and um and everything that that just really was the foundation for everything that followed and And i'll make a quick analogy because i know this is supposed to be rapid fire but um like we talked about how journey is is historically my favorite band and i think journey gets unfairly um, pigeonholed by some people as a commercial pop band because they only think of the four or five top Mm -hmm. 10 hits that come to mind first, which are kind of sappy ballads, but you dive deeper into their catalog and there's some blues and rock and some stuff that's really heavy. And I think the same can be said of the Beatles. When you think of the first five or six Beatles songs that come to mind, they might be, I want to hold your hand. Right. And they're simplistic, but some of the other stuff like come together, like they, they rocked. There were times that they really got raw Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and didn't need everything to sound really slick and overproduced. And I think that has over time kind of become what's defined them for me and, and allowed me to respect them to the point. Beach, that beach or mountains. Oh, fuck. At the older really I get hard question. It used to be mountains, beach, it's beach that I'm an old man and I want to be on a beach and, and I'm with I want you down. I'm a, beach guy. I'm a beach guy. Degrees and breezy and sand, and I want to be looking water. Out the I like water. Yep, I'm, I'm a water guy. I love the beach. Absolutely love the beach. And every year, I make a point of getting to getting to the ocean. Um, and There's taking something my family. just every single awesome. year. I have to do it. Yeah, but my favorite memories are of the mountains. And I summited um, Mount Olympus back when it was summitable. Um, mm. Now it's not because they've so much of the ice and snow have melted. You can't get up it anymore. And I did Mount Adams and Glacier Peak and Mount Baker and everything else in the Pacific Northwest. And those as a, as a, I don't want to say a kid because I was like 14, 18, somewhere in, yep. in that range. Those are my favorite memories in that age range and some of my favorite memories growing up. But every year I have to get to see the ocean. I have to get to the beach. Wow. And that's it's to me that's the difference. important living in Phoenix too. Yeah. You gotta get you gotta get out there. If you wanna yeah. go, that's that's what separates them for me too. It's like climbing mountains is a different thing. But like if I wanna go, I live in the shadow of Mount Rainier. If I wanna go mm-hmm. to Mount Rainier because it's so beautiful, and to this day, as long as I've been living in this area, born and raised here, if it's sunny and I see that mountain on my way to work, I it stops me in my tracks. I it never ever ceases to amaze me. But if I want to go yeah. to that mo- mountain, guess what happens when I get there? I can't see it. Yeah. I get there right. And I'm in the woods and I can't see the mountain. <laughs> Whereas right. the ocean, I go to the, o- and it's right there. And it's just so awesome. Mm-hmm. And, it's easy uh, to be when you're in it. It's easy to be in it. It's easy to be part of yeah. the story. The when sound, you're in the ocean. It's just so yeah. calming. And until you're at the top, Mm. God, honestly, guys, having been, having summited a, 
almost every mountain in the Pacific Northwest, there is something about being up there and looking around and there's oh, nothing it's just too much work right now. There's nothing <laughs> above you. It. It's all below you. So it I live phenomenal. in the tallest, I live right next to the tallest peak in Phoenix, which is Piestua Peak. Used to be Squaw Peak. Yeah. We now call it Piestua it's Phoenix. Peak. peak is in quotation marks. And, yeah, it's like they call things know, mountains there. It's that are like, like 850 feet or whatever, right? But it's, you know, when you start at zero, you're mm-hmm. 850 feet and about a half a mile is a pretty decent elevation <laughs> right. hike, at least for a guy like me. Um, okay. Uh, who is your favorite Seahawk of all time? Doesn't even have to be a player. Just who around the organization? Oh, favorite. Okay. So it's Jim Zorn for me. Uh, and, and I almost said Matt Hasselbeck, but like growing up, like Jim Zorn was the guy that made me love football. His personality, the way he played the game. I got to meet him a number of times. Like it just, I, that has to be, that's, that's my answer. Jim Zorn. Bill, a- a- answer the question on my behalf. Who's my favorite Seahawk of all time? Cortez Kennedy. And why? Because he was, he was a difference maker in the middle of a defense and you you love defense. Yeah. In the middle of I the mean, defense, he was, he in the defensive line. Was it because he never had to worry about he what he had ate? To, well, and he played on <laughs> shitty teams, which made it all the more spectacular yeah. for yeah. him as an individual player. Yep. And he never um, mailed it in, ever. Yeah, he never mailed. God, the guy was on some of the worst teams in NFL history. Was the defensive player of the year on a team that went 2-14. and 14. Won two games, yep. Okay, so for me... That'll never happen again, by the way. It will never happen again. Ever. So in fear of being called who knows what. (laughs) Are you going to say Geno Smith? No, I like like our old quarterback. Russ. Russ. I I do. Oh, Russ. For me, me, he was the first player in a long time when, when he came on that made me giddy. Like he was just so much fun. Giddy of of, of like fun. laughing of of laughing at football again of being joyful of yeah. of being uh, just happy of winning going out and winning games on his own like be, we'd never had a player like that that could just literally take a play a team on his on his shoulders and go out and win games and put us in a position to be successful and we were successful. Um, he gets dissed on a lot, and I get it. He's got a lot I think, going on. I think over his, time, his outside of football that's relationships that's and all yeah. that stuff. And but you know what? For ten years, man, he was the dude, and he did that really well. I I suspect that over time, that the the blowback is going to fade. Like like his personality was off putting, especially near the end. I was over it. I was tired of it. Sure, um, I get that. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 the game kind of passed him by the last couple of years too. Like it just didn't. And so did his doing legs. anymore. But he was such a spectacular player. And we talked about how uh, Richard Sherman kind of changed the position, like. Russell Wilson kind of opened the floodgates a little bit. Like he would Bryce Young have ever been the number one pick in the draft? Would Kyler Murray have ever been the number one pick in the draft? No. If, I, I if honestly Russell Wilson no. hadn't come first. No. Yeah. yeah. It, he, Russ opened the door for the shorter quarterback, especially the absolutely. shorter athletic quarterback. And when we think about that sort of which was a very brief period where the the read option thing was such a weapon in the NFL, like he was the dude. He was the guy at the forefront of that, yeah. that they made yeah. that work and it made it so difficult on defenses and, and um, yeah, some of the throws he was like I'll, Dante, he was like Dante Culpepper on steroids. I'll never forget some of his throws, the, the throw against the Houston Texans where he did the three sixty. Remember that where he's scrambling out to the right side and he turned around yep. the, the throw Doug, with, Doug in Baldwin the action Dan green on Sunday night his, football against his the Rams. first year where he, be, where he, 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 he won left. against um, New England Patriots. Yep. You know, and nobody expected them to win that game. And he came in and, and won that game. The defense, you know, really disrupted um, that that game. And and that was Is his that the You Mad Bro game? Yeah, You Mad Bro. Yep. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Well, and the the first the first memory I have really of of Russell Wilson where I thought, oh, this guy's gonna be great 
was, I mean, there were actually moments in his first start against Arizona where they went down to the end. He threw a couple balls to Baldwin. And he just couldn't get it. He couldn't yeah, make right. it happen. Couldn't finish, right. But uh, that Chicago game, his rookie year at oh, Chicago, God, that is, that where he had to lead yeah. two game-winning yeah. drives. He had to lead the yeah. drive down at the end of regulation to tie it, send it to overtime, and then another drive yep. all the way down. He did it with yep. running and throwing. I was like, wow, this is not just a fluke. This is something mm -hmm. special here. And it, it's unfortunate yes. because yes. I do think he could have handled things differently. And in a way that maybe he would still be here, but he yeah. just wasn't, that's just not where his head was. And it's not where his focus was. He was so worried wasn't. about legacy and he mm -hmm. wasn't well, worried about playing the game in front of him. Yeah. And then him going to Denver and demanding his own corner office and yeah, his, his own teammates coaches. could only contact Jake, Jake him Heaps. I love Jake, through, but, yeah. through his agent or his publicist, I guess. And just the ego. And, and the way that he ran that in in mm -hmm. Denver really just screwed up his. That was legacy. rock bottom for him. I mean, I will say this: I, I think he might have a him. really good year this year. Like I, I do agree. I think he's I think he's in the perfect place that plays the perfect style that has a defense to support him and an offensive line that you know and all the weapons and like, a team that doesn't give a shit. They right? paid him it, one point five. And whatever. I also feel yeah. like there's some signs that maybe he understands now. He's not going to get to throw it forty times. And that's yeah. that's not his game because now I I've seen the videos I knew you you Najee guys have Harris too. is going to be it, a great. Bat he looks like he's in the best shape he's ever been. In. Like, yeah. I think it was kind of genius for the Steelers to go out and get Justin Fields, <laughs> just to kind of be like, hey, you know, right. we got a guy. It's not Suck we're it just up, not dude. handing it to you. If you're yeah, if you if you you pull that shit that you did in Denver, try to yeah. pull it here. We got another guy. We'll manage on. the game. Have that dominant running job. game. And hit a couple of big play. Like he could have a really, really good year. That team could win. Like the Steelers. And the fact that they're only paying him a million and a half and they're never going to have to pay him more because he's never going to come out and be like, hey, I demand to be, you know, one of the no. top, top paid no, guys. Have that market again. Be, well, forget not having that market. He's getting paid that money from Denver. Yeah. And if he, if he asks Pittsburgh to pay him that, it's all in offsets. Yeah. So Pittsburgh has to pay him instead of Denver. Denver mm -hmm. has Denver then has less money to pay him, and they get to get better, and Pittsburgh gets worse. So he hits, it. It doesn't affect him. It doesn't help him financially for him to make those demands. And being so he, in Pittsburgh on the East Coast, in Pittsburgh, and he's not even on the coast, um, I think is a perfect spot for him to kind of just try to redefine himself a little bit mm -hmm. if if yeah. he takes it if he takes the opportunity because he's tarnished right now you know i don't even know if he makes the hall of fame because well, and and it's not just a it's not just a seahawks fandom thing that, that's turned against him it's the entire league now granted everyone doesn't like sean payton just as much because he the, a lot of people feel like he was mistreated there maybe yeah. so maybe not i don't know but it's time for him to turn it around and it's in his hands. And yeah, it's a good I'll opportunity say, for him. If Denver does well um, with Bo Nix, mm. um, mm. Russ's Russ's yeah. doesn't submit doesn't sniff the Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's an interesting standpoint. But what if Russ goes out and throws for four thousand yards, thirty touchdowns, yeah, ten picks? It's on, it's on Russ, yes, and of they make it to the know. AFC Championship game. And the fact you know, I. And, and he I think has that's a more good telling. year. Keith, Keith, that's more telling. That would be more telling on Sean Payton to me. I think that the fact that Seahawks got better when Russ left and Geno Smith, who is viewed as a mediocre player, was better than Russ. Um, and Pete Carroll, it was the whole view of it, it was it Russ or Pete? And why would you pick the old coach over the young quarterback? Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, Pete and, and freaking Geno were better. Uh, and then. You know, if if Sean Payton and Bo Nix, who's viewed as like, God, that was an overdraft. They should never, you know, th second, third round court talent, whatever. If that's better than Russ, God, that's going to hurt Russ's legacy so hard. Yeah. I'm proud of us for not diving into the Geno Smith debate because we might be, that would have probably added another hour. I had a, I had a Geno question and I left it <laughs> and I think yeah. I will. All right, you guys, it's been amazing. I think we're going to wrap yeah. this thing. 
Yeah, it's, it's, time. it's crazy. This thing Three is hours isn't our longest show together, yeah. but you know, no, it's, it's, not. It's, it's pretty good territory. I was going to say it's, it's getting close to that July of whatever year um, right. show that we had together yeah. and in downtown uh, Seattle for that live show. That was amazing. Oh, at Ozzy's. Um, that was awesome. Too bad the audio was, yeah. was off. That was, such uh, a, that it's was all a, my fault. Yeah. That was in the moment before we learned that the audio was off. That was such a good show. That yeah, was such a that fun was a good show. time. And getting Corbin in there was was helpful too. So. Yeah, yeah well, that was yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, you guys, thank you. I mean, for our eighth annual, this was amazing. Keith and I have been at this a long time. Dan, you've been at this a long time. It's good to get us all together in the same room. Uh, we've been all friends together uh, within this community for for quite a while, and and definitely friends of each other's shows over the years. So thank you again. You can follow Dan on Seahawks Forever on Twitter. He's got his own podcast, as you guys know, Seahawks Forever podcast on every favorite podcast platform that you can imagine in his own YouTube channel. Become very successful, I would say, over the last 18 months or so. Yes, Dan? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sirs. Thank Killing you. Yeah. It. Continues yeah. to grow. I, I have a really cool viewer base and and uh, have some cool things to announce over the next couple of months of some growth of the channel and some opportunities have come come our way. So. Um, yeah, just continue at it. And, uh, it, it's, you guys, I'm sure would agree with this hundred percent. It's, it's the engagement of the viewers and the mm -hmm. listeners that make it even more fun. Like when I started podcasting, I just had stuff to say, and I didn't know if anyone would ever listened to it. I just wanted to get it out. But as it started to find traction, um, and, and kind of garner the, the right audience, like that's what keeps me going is the engagement in the comments and the, the debate and, and, and the conversation. I love that stuff. And it's always fun to come on with you guys. And I think we have something uh, coming up uh, later in the month too, with the, uh, with Bryce and Ryan and those guys from, from Hawksome. I think they've reached out to you about a big round yeah. table. So yep. we're going to we'll always do the crossover right? stuff. I always love lifting yeah. up other great content creators. There's a lot of them in the Seahawks space. Yep. And so it's a lot of fun. I will say this. I, I learned this writing is um, yeah, it's about, it starts out with, you have something to say, but it really comes down to, uh, the people who read it or listen to it or whatever, they are, they're what matters. They're what makes the writing or the, the podcasting meaningful because without someone to read or listen, it doesn't matter what you have to say. Yeah. And, yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for Dan's listeners for coming along. Um, and thank you to our listeners as well. It's been a great time to get together, ask all the fun questions. Uh, really enjoyed the show. We've got to currently right now, we've got 258 uh, current uh, watchers of the nice. live stream. So that's, uh, that's a great number. Great. Amazing uh, to have all you guys with us and uh, fun show. First of July, uh, we're only now to uh, what inside three weeks from yeah. training camp when it's rookies start showing up, we can start talking about real football again. What's mm -hmm. actually going on with the team excited for this season, lots of changes, a new era really of Seahawks football. Uh, and we're all here to kind of cover it for you. And, um, and uh, super excited for that. So you can find uh, Dan again at Seahawks forever. You can find Keith, at Myers NFL, you can find me at NW Seahawk. You know where the show's at. Subscribe to both channels. It's great. You don't miss a show that way. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Go, Hawks. Fun. Go, Go Hawks. Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.